still scheduled or no? Yes. yes. Okay. I think what, what I'd like to do is start with our typical hellos and introductions, good mornings, and then uh, move to the presentation as we gather our forum. So, Paul, you want to start us? Um, Paul Danu, uh, College Business Manager and Risk Assessment. Arno Plana, Comptroller. Colleen Quinn, College Senate Chair, Mathematics Faculty at South Campus. Kathy Colesto, AVP at IRA. Aaron Brannan, Professor of Math at North Campus and FFECC Grievance Chair. Eric Young is the AVP at the moment. Dan Frontier for Student Affairs. Mike Barone, Interim Vice President for Marketing and Communications. Nate Wachowski, Industrial Technology. Casey Denary, student. <laughs> Aaron Gangler, student. Allison Pubbinsong, student. Juan Martinez, Dean of Business and Public Service. Carrie Kahn, Executive Dean of Health Sciences and Natural Sciences. Kelly Reedy, VP of Workforce Development. Kelly Wachowski, Assistant to the Board of Trustees. Tom Tremonti, IT. Ryan Noble, IT. Ken Crilly, Trustee. Jeff Stone, trustee. <clears throat> I didn't have to take that officer in charge. Uh, Marcel Suarez, student trustee. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, great turnout. Yeah. Statements are not yet available, so the college does typically wait for those issued statements before they release final. Carl, if I could just interrupt you. Uh, we have a quorum of six now, so I'd like to take roll and declare a quorum and officially right. convene the meeting. So, Kel uh, Kelly, would you mind calling the roll? Our secretary is absent today. Just Melody Baker. Here. Ken Crowley. Here. Len Lenahan. Absent. Amanda Lowe. She just stepped out. Oh, she's here. We, we've seen her. Candace Morrison. Here. Carrie Phillips. Absent. Jeffrey Stone. Here. I'm Marcel. Source here. Here. Thank you. Okay, so I declare a, a quorum as president as soon as Amanda returns to the room, and uh, we can continue with the meeting. Thanks. Go ahead. No Carl. problem. Okay. So, moving on. First, th this is an item that's a pretty important piece of our audit. Each year, the external auditors has some required areas that are that need to be communicated to the auditee. So to the audit committee, we went through each of these areas in detail, um, but for the whole group today, I just wanted to highlight a couple. And the first is our responsibility under generally accepted auditing standards. Um, two main areas here to point out. Our responsibility is to design and perform an audit so that ultimately we can provide our professional opinion on the financial statements. And what's important there is to know that our responsibility is to perform an audit and gain assurance to provide our opinion. It's not responsibility for the financial statements. These are the college's financial statements maintained you know, by finance and everyone involved throughout the year, recording transactions in the general ledger. So I'd just like to point out that you know, oftentimes you might hear it's Dresher Malecki's financial statements, and that's that's a little you know, inaccurate to say that. They're the college's financial statements that have been audited by Joshua Malecki. The other piece of responsibility I like to point out to a full board is that when you hear auditors, you often might associate it with searching for fraud. So while we're aware of um, and have some procedures to look for fraud throughout the financial statement audit, our audit is designed to gain assurance over financial statement dollar amounts. It is not designed to search and find fraud. So I just wanted to point that out. There are different forensic type accountants and auditors that that might be their focus. And that's typically something that would be requested by the college. Um, but this year, you know, we can report, while it wasn't the focus of our audit, also nothing came to our attention, which is a good thing. Second to last there is independence. If readers and users of the college's financial statements are going to be relying on Drescher Malecki to serve as that outside unbiased source who's saying these financial statements can be relied upon inherent with our professional opinion, then it's, it's absolutely imperative that we're independent from the college and the board members. 
uh, wouldn't be appropriate if we had any conflicts of interest. For instance, if Arda happened to be my sister, I wouldn't be in the appropriate position to serve as the external auditor. So I'm you know, exaggerating the point there, but I think everybody understands that as your external auditors, independence is something that just has to be present. Um, we evaluate this every year that we do the audit. We do it with all of our clients, and this year, again, we're, we're independent and ready to serve as the external audit role. Finally, other matters, just an update for what audit deliverables come out each year hmm. associated with Professor Malecki Services. Somebody wants to do as a professional mind is the school. Excuse me. Excuse me, Carl, go ahead. That would be the financial statements, which has a single audit, which is a federal compliance audit, a management letter, an auditor's communication letter, which formalizes these items here, as well as some assistance and filing um, a federal awards and financial statement to the Federal Audit Clearing House. So we help out with that as well. Are there any questions on the audit process? The next slides we get into the financial results. Very good. So moving on, you know, this is a, a slideshow that we have rolled forward and carried forward each year because it's been helpful. Um, this particular slide presents the revenue and expense activity of the college for each of the last five years across a line graph. The solid lines are going to indicate the revenue and expense activity that are reported in the financial statements. The dotted lines are pulling out certain items that after discussions with the audit committee and management were something that wanted to be presented to the full board just to illustrate the effect of some of these one-time or non-cash items. So in the financial statements, your solid revenue line is the blue line for 2022, totaled $127,000,000. On the expense side, your solid red down below for $118,000,000. The net income in the college's reported financial statements is just shy of $9 million for the year. Um, and when you consider the dotted lines, on the revenue side, we've been asked to pull out the one-time federal aid. So money that came in during the year that isn't anticipated in future years, not something you plan on in operations. And that $127 million falls down to $119 million. On the expense side of things, there are a few estimates related to long-term liabilities in the financial statements that don't have a cash effect or a real budget effect to the college. So when you pull out the effects of what's called the OPEP and net pension liabilities, um, that $118 million actually rises to $123 million. So it turns in from on the reported financial statements an in income of about $9 million. When you pull out these one times and look at more of a budget perspective, it's actually a use or a decrease in that position of four million. And as you listen so to this, it's, it's important to yeah. realize that when Carl speaks of a year, he's talking of our fiscal year, which ends on August 31st, 2022. It's not through today. It's not through the end of 2022 at Christmas time. It's last summer. Yes, thank you, Jeff. So these. Of course, the financial statements are as of August 31st, 2022, um, and they do include a prior year's financial statement in there too. It's called comparative financial statements. So 2022 is presented alongside 2021 in this year's report. Charles is gonna walk through the rest of the presentation, just a brief explanation for some of the changes on the financials, as well as our overall observations. Yeah, so here we start with just a one uh, year over year comparison. We talk about comparative financial statements where we're showing 2021 and 2022. So, really, it highlights of, of the graph operating revenues increased $7.6 million. That was made possible mainly through the ARPA funding, through the HERF or the Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds of $10.3 million. On the non operating, revenue side in financial statements, an overall increase of 2.4, which directly correlates with the budgeted county contribution increase this year of $2.6 million. 
for operating expenses. Um, it was expected to see operating expenses increase with operating revenue, especially with that ARPA funding to allocate uh, those funds towards additional spending. So what we saw is a $2.5 million increase in expenses, scholarship, which is, was directly a component of the um, ARPA funding, increased $6.3 million. Um, that was partially offset with salaries and wages, which were uh, decisions that were made, decisions that were made at college. So salaries and wages decreased $4.6 million. And then general contractual supplies, services, and general general costs increased two and a half million dollars, which explained that increase. This slide here is a slide that uh, we were asked to include a couple of years ago when there was some declining trends in cash positions or in the cash position there. Um, in 2020, cash was down to $19 million. Um, over the last two years, you've seen an increase, uh, obviously, which is a positive sign. Up, up to $31.6 million as of August 31, 2022. Uh, but we just continue to bring awareness um, that a lot of this increase in cash was related to the, the federal stimulus money that uh, is no longer available for future years as, as far as ARPA funds are concerned. Uh, similar, this slide was also um, kind of requested over the past couple of years and it shows a good picture. The only thing uh, that I want to highlight is the parentheses at the top that it is unaudited. So what this chart really does is it takes the unrestricted net position, the first number that comes directly from the financial statements that are audited, um, and then it, it pulls out the long-term items that um, allow you to see a more current financial focus or your budgeted items. So it, it, it results in an unrestricted fund balance number, but there's that asterisk uh, that talks about um, how much is appropriate of that that of those funds in, in the subsequent year's budget. But once again, that, that number is unaudited. So as of August 31, 2022, the financial statements has an understatement net position of about $202 million in deficit position. But once again, you pull out those long-term legacy costs and other post-employment benefits, the Gatsby 75 of $219 million, and you pull out the net pension liability that has a long-term focus, and then you get to a current financial position of your budgeted funds of about $14.7 million. And that's, once again, that's an audited, but that's something we're going to talk about in the subsequent slide in bringing awareness to um, our management letter. So this is the end of our converse, of our presentation, but uh, part of the observation is to discuss our management letter with this group. We went into detail with the budget audit, or the budget audit and HR committee earlier but the management letter is, is basically bringing awareness uh, to trends that you all are already aware of. And so we, we, we've designed this letter over the last couple of years to indicate the trends in enrollment data across the state, which has been declining at about 34% over the last 10 years. If we focus on, those are SUNY community colleges. The, over the last years have declined at 34%. Specific to SUNY Erie, that decline is 37% over that 10 year period. It's a little higher than the statewide average, which is already high. And so we talk about this decline and what's helped balance this decline over the last couple of years, and you've seen some positive cash position is, is that federal money that came in for ARPA, uh, for higher education emergency relief funds. Those resulted in one time revenues of $23.5 million that helped you stay afloat. But as we see in the 2023 budget, uh, there is no longer money designated for those federal contract, which is why in the budget that, that amount is zero for 2023 and looking forward. So it's something that we wanna keep bringing awareness of. And so because the budget for 2023 included zero federal funds, the budget appropriated about $8.9 million to balance the budget for 2023. And so what that does is if we had, on the previous slide, we showed $14.7 million of unrestricted fund balance. If 2023 comes to fruition as, as budgeted, that $14.7 million is gonna be just under $6 million of available fund balance left for future years. So just continue to bring awareness of, also that the, the college has a fund balance policy to maintain unrestricted fund balance of about 
two months worth of operating expenditures, which is 60%. And as of now, um, based on 2022 unrestricted fund balance number of 14.7 that we showed on the previous slide, that represents about 12.6% of spending. So you'd be below the recommended two months uh, policy. So it's something that we continue to rec recommend and bring forward and raise awareness um, so that plans in place and, and discussions are being had. A couple of points here subject to Ken's thoughts and others on, on the board. But basically, it's important to keep in mind that uh, that our, our professionals are speaking as of August 31st. I made the point earlier. So, and they're talking about the budget that we adopted one year ago in May, which did in fact call for nine million of expenditure from the reserve fund to balance the budget had we not taken any other steps. But of course, uh, although it isn't particularly reflected in the numbers as of 831.22, we do have a 210 person headcount reduction here at the college approximately, I think, 65 through retirements and the rest through uh, positions being eliminated, layoffs. So 210 down, you will see as we go progress through this discussion that the notion that the fund balance is going to be at 6 million and 10 million below where it should be uh, is not actually happening now here in March, April of 2023. They're not speaking of it because they're frozen as of 831.22 in this report. But it is really important to understand that we did take steps in light of what the, it, we didn't just keep the budget as we expected it to in April of a year ago. Now, why did we not anticipate the layoffs and the retirements in the budget a year ago? Because they weren't happening yet and we didn't know their scope. And we took a conservative position that we would budget as if no steps would be taken. And that's what they're reporting on. So you have to be very careful as you listen to this because it doesn't exactly point to where the college is right now. It does accurately point to where it was as the layoffs and retirements were beginning to kick in in August of last year. By the way, for those interested in seeing the very good management letter, it's, and, and I recommend it to everyone, be, it's between page 37 and 40 of our materials, and I direct people particularly to page 39, where the enrollment trends that were mentioned by uh, Carl, I believe, were highlighted, both statewide and at SUNY Erie. 34% uh, decline since 2012 <coughs> in enrollment statewide at community colleges, 37% enrollment here since in that same period of time. So. We're uh, lagging just a bit behind what's happening statewide, but it's not as if SUNY Erie is the only place that's experiencing enrollment declines. So this is a systemic issue that the state is attempting to deal with, boards all over the state are attempting to deal with, faculty members, staff, everyone has to grapple with this. So uh, the numbers are stark and the state is at least responding or attempting to. The federal government response was born of the pandemic and it, as they mentioned, is not going to be repeated. But what's somewhat more encouraging is the state at least is looking at it and saying, we see this declining enrollment and we're, we're taking at least some measures to try to help you. How significant they are to be determined, what we do in response to them to be determined. But I just want to sh paint a broader picture than what we're hearing as of August 31st last year. Stop there, I'll stop there. Very good, Jeff, thank you very much. Everybody, thanks for your time and I think Jeff, your comments are, are very much appropriate because it, it doesn't seem fair to present on August 31st, 2022 information and stop there um, with the picture that it made. So I really do appreciate you bringing the, the audience and the group up to date for what has transpired in the fiscal year into 2023 that you know we look forward to taking a look at those audited financial statements on next year's audit. Yeah, um, so and we realize that you guys are constrained by reporting at, at, as of that mark in time, but we're just adding context. Yep. Very good. Okay. Is Thanks for your I usual mean, good work. Oh, oh, go ahead. Are you all set? I was just thanking you for your, your usual good work in presenting these numbers. Very welcome. All set? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Our students, yes, absolutely, please. Absolutely, absolutely. So good morning, everyone. Um, part of our uh, student first and academic uh, excellent, we have uh, our students here with our department chair, uh, Nate, Mr. Nate Wostowski, who is uh, uh, a department chair for the Industrial Technology and CNC. 
So our students are here to uh, present something special for our board, right? So sorry, this probably won't be as riveting as those financial statements. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, our students decided to uh, make you guys some, some business card holders as a, as a gift for the board members. Um, Too nice. Consequently, we, we made up some, uh, <laughs> some business cards just from the information that was available on the website. So it doesn't have your phone number or anything on it. Um, we thought if you wanted some, we could contact marketing and, and you get some, some ECC business cards. But we have them here. These are our students here that, uh, as part of our advanced CNC class, this is a class where the students design and build their own projects. So, uh, an aside to that, they, to, to steal Karen's big word, collaboratively um, worked on this project. So, I don't know if uh, you want to hear from the students a little bit about the process. Well, we're really glad you're here. I mean, everything we're doing in this room, everyone, is about you guys. So we're glad you're here. Mm -hmm. We're trying to make the best decisions we can to help you on your educational journey uh, into a, you know adulthood and, and, and hopefully a, a good, successful life and career. Uh, and it's exciting that you're here and that you found a path. I know in the past we've been curious about what may have drawn you to ECC or what uh, led you to a particular path of studies. So. If you want to just share your name again and, and give us a little background, that would be lovely. Uh, I'm Nelson Pumpentong. Um I was originally at UB uh, for computer science, but I didn't really <coughs> enjoy the computer science, so my father... Sorry, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my father uh, actually does um, CNC work at uh, Viant, and he, he recommended me, so that's how I got into this program. My name is Casey Denary. Um, I like hands-on stuff, and you guys have a great CNC program. You guys have a lot of machines um, with manual and CNC lathes, uh, mills, so it was just um, a, a great chance for me to get in and try different stuff. You also guys got the new Fanuc machines in, um, and I'm learning the code for that as well. Mm. So uh, it's just a really and, and good chance. Just help us with that acronym, C E C. Did you say C E C? Computer. C N C. C N C. Yes, it's just the machines. I mean, okay. The what does that stand for? Computer numeric control. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. You so. just have a good range of machines for students. Yeah. Um, I'm Karen again, and um, I got interested in machining while I was working, doing planning and purchasing, and um, it just looked a lot more interesting than <laughs> what I was doing in the office. <laughs> so I decided to go back to school and. Um, I really like it. It reminds me of my days back at UB doing um, earth science and lab stuff. I like the hands-on work. Do you do some of your work at Northland or is it nanotechnology building or where are you? No, right in the, the 300 wing of B building. So okay. a couple couple wings down from, from nano. Have you had difficulty getting to campus and just sorting that out? I know it's been difficult with the pandemic and so forth, but. No. You okay? No, no, no. Everything's been pretty smooth. Yeah. I haven't had any issues. All right. I'd love to hear the process of actually making <laughs> the cool mess. <laughs> you could talk us through that. Yeah, so we use a 3D modeling software called SolidWorks. So we can actually draw this whole card holder in SolidWorks. Um, we can see exactly how it's going to look like before we make it. From there, we bring it from SolidWorks to another program called MasterCam. And from there, we create this thing called Toolpaths. So we tell the CNC machine kind of where to go. Um, and after we create Toolpaths, and there, there could be a bunch of them, from the engraving to kind of the, the surface milling here. But after we do that, we can tell MasterCam to make us G-code. And G-code is what the CNC machine reads. It doesn't just read our words, it reads the coding. So you, we have to learn G-code. Um, but what MasterCam does is it makes it for us. So after we design it, we put it into MasterCam, it makes a G-code, and then we have to go to the machine, and we have to set up these things called work offsets and tool offsets to make sure the machine doesn't crash because it makes loud, nasty noises. <laughs> so um, once we do that, um, we kind of let the machine go um, and then watch it carefully because um, anything can happen <laughs> at any moment. It's pretty scary. Um, but. Um, yeah, and then we just kind of give it a nice polish to make it look nice and shiny. So yeah. So to, to step that back just a little bit, so these these business card holders started off as a as a twelve foot piece of aluminum, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. first the the piece of aluminum's well first they decided on the design, 
and and like Casey said, they designed it in SolidWorks. From there, it was cut in a saw. From the saw, then it was taken to the CNC machines. And these, because there's machining on, on multiple sides of it, are multiple setups in the machine. So it's not like you just put the piece of material in the machine, close the door, hit the button. There's, there's setups involved for each step of that process. So on every side, there's a, a different program that runs a different setup, a different work holding device. So there's, there's a, quite a bit that, that goes into, into producing something. So I think the students, in, and it was a great class to do it with in the advanced CNC, because that's what they're learning. It's kind of a capstone class where they're putting everything together that they've learned throughout various different um, classes in our program. Nick, can you speak a little bit to the theory part of it? The theory of it, well, it's it's manufacturing process really is what we're doing. So we work with what we call our Machining and Manufacturing Alliance. There's about 130 companies that we work with that help drive our curriculum. Um, they tell us what they want us to teach because they want to hire our students to work in their their facilities. There's tons and tons of opportunities. Um, the the theory behind it is the design work, is the programming, is the setup, is the manufacturer, is the final project, is the, the, the painting and polishing that went into this. So local companies, there's over a thousand local manufacturing companies right here in Western New York. Some you've heard the names of, some you will never hear the name of, but they all need people, right? The graying of the workforce is very real in manufacturing um, and there's nobody to replace them. So these students are in, in huge demand. Um, we've got more more jobs for these students than, than we have students for sure. Um, so they're here to learn the process to produce something from design through finished product. And, and this was a nice, a nice thing for them to do because it, it did that for them, right? From soup to nuts, from, from raw material to finished product and everything in between, they were able to uh, do. Well, we thank you for our gifts, and, and it must be very exciting to hear words like that for you as, <laughs> as you're commencing on a career, and you just know that demand is out there. And what we're trying to do is figure out, you know, where what those community partners and employers need, and try to shape our curriculum here so that students like you can find a pathway to those good jobs. So he does a pretty good job. He he um. He walked down things. our hallway and he actually lines the hallway with a bunch of job opportunities you can read really? on. Really? Yeah. So yeah. There, as you walk down, there's a bunch of papers. <laughs> there's got to be at least yeah. like 30 of them. And every time there's a job opportunity, he kind of like, um, he sends it to the class so that yeah. everyone gets a fair chance. Well, yeah, but just yesterday, Corning Glass was, uh, um, contacted me. They want to, they, they're looking to hire apprentices basically to start at $33.53 an hour so they're recruiting out of our program. Right. Say, As say. an apprentice? An apprentice, wow. yeah, just fresh out of school. <laughs> Where were you guys when I was like 20 <laughs> years ago? <laughs> <laughs> Well, if anything doesn't work out in advanced manufacturing, anything involving public speaking, you guys rock. Yeah. Oh my God, you guys are amazing. Very well done. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Wow. Very impressive. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So uh, we're now going to move to the thanks very much. Thank you. The consent Bye. agenda. Uh, but before we do, I would like to uh, once again officially welcome Ken Cruley. I believe this is your first <laughs> meeting actually at the table. Uh, you've been, you've chaired a budget committee meeting already. You've been approved by the legislature. About my fifth meeting. I know. I'm introducing you all the time. But here you are finally at a real board meeting. Right. So <laughs> welcome, you. Ken. Thank We're delighted much. to have you here. Uh, if, if only to complete a quorum this morning. <laughs> but we're always so happy that you're in the mix. Um, and as I mentioned, you did do a, a splendid job on the budget committee. Ken has taken that committee. We'll be talking a little bit more about committees later. But for now, I'd like to ask uh, for any comments on the Board of Trustee minutes from February 23rd, our last meeting. If there are none, then a motion to approve. So moved. Okay, thank you. Ken, second. second. Uh, Melody and Ken, uh, any, aye. any further discussion? If not, all in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 They are approved, and always a good job. Thank you for those minutes. So that's all, the only item on the consent agenda. We have an informational item, uh, well, actually an approval item for disposition of materials. It's on page 21, and it didn't involve all that much. You can take, uh, you can see that uh, 
it's on the list and it's basically a couple of ovens and a law enforcement driving simulator and x-ray machine. Some of them had significant value, especially the driving simulator, but it's all been fully depreciated and I presume it's at the end of its useful life. So uh, if, unless there's any uh, questions or objections to that, I'll take a motion to approve the disposal <coughs> of these materials per page 21 list and 22. I'll make a motion. Thank you. Second. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 <coughs> the disposition of those materials is approved. And we now have uh, uh, the committee briefings. So let me start there with just a, some, a few thoughts that we're, we're doing with the committees. We took with the eight seats now filled, and you've heard me every meeting talk about the need to fill the additional two seats so we get to 10. We can't wait any longer to get those two seats filled. So we're going to take the eight of us that we have now with Ken and Denise having migrated off the board. We're, we're just thinking about everybody's strengths as a group and where people can have a leadership role or a secondary role, a membership role in a committee. And we're, we're basically following the advice of SUNY and some discussion we had at a retreat uh, last week that basically the members of this committee will be the trustees but there will be support staff from the college as appropriate on the committees. And it's always been a little confusing. Am I a member of the committee? Am I a vote? The only, under the SUNY guidance, the only people of a board committee who actually are members of that committee and vote are the trustees on the committee. So we'll set it up that way. The list will say committee members, committee chair, there will, and there will be the board members. Um, all of us are comfortable with that. Um, and we'll certainly still have many more people than the trustees at those committee, but they'll be having input and adding and, and doing their usual role, but we're just clarifying in alignment with what SUNY says should be done in terms of board committees. So um, that's happening, and then what Adiam has done is gone through after input from the board and ratification at our informal retreat last week of exactly who's in what committee and what we're doing. So. The new committees, broadly speaking, are budget, audit, and, and facilities. Facilities going to go with budget, and we're moving the um, human resources piece out of that committee and making it its own standalone committee. And it, ha it has a different name than that, and it's going to be under Amanda Lau's leadership. But we are interested in having a focus on all matter of issues and questions that relate to our interaction with those who work at the college and uh, others at the college, but particularly our employees. So we've got the contracts with our bargaining units, we've got uh, periodic grievances, uh, Adrian's here, this is a part of that. So, um, and, and it can be very constructive, you know, but we have to just make sure that we have adequate board oversight of that and attention to that. So I think with Amanda's background as a, as a, a lawyer at a very prominent firm, uh, in this area, I think that would be good leadership for the committee. And with helping her will be uh, Len Lenahan, who is, as you know, former personnel director of Erie County, has got a good background in personnel, and Candace Morrison, who also works in this space as an attorney. So I think that'll be a strong committee for us. And the budget folks can, f uh, we, we, we do realize that human resources and our wage base and our folks are where all the money is spent at the college virtually. So you can't reasonably separate budget and personnel. However, we want to do it this way so that each gets appropriate attention in the right way. So that's, and Amanda can talk a little bit more about what they've decided to name that committee. So uh, the other is, of course, curriculum, student success, and diversity. We're not changing that. And uh, that's, Melody is a member of that as vice chair, and Candace is our chair there. Uh, human resources, which I know has a, an updated name based on your discussions. Amanda is chairing that with Len, as I mentioned, and Candace. Marketing will continue to be chaired by uh, Len Lenahan, and with him will be Marcel, because that makes just sense to have you know, a student thinking about how we might better market to students. So at least that's our thinking, and Amanda as well uh, there as a member of that committee. And then uh, on policy, Melody had stepped up when she first became a trustee to take that committee. We're grateful for that. Uh, think about our rules and operations. Uh, Ken Cruley is a member of that committee as well, assisting there, and they will meet as needed. Some of these committees will meet monthly, some will meet less frequently, depending on the workload and what's going on. Strategic planning and assessment will, it, it will continue to be chaired by Carrie Phillips, 
I will have a role on that committee, as will our Vice Chair Melody Baker. Technology will continue to be chaired by Carrie Phillips, and Amanda will be on that committee as another trustee member. So that's the broad outline. Not a great deal of change. The main thing is splitting the human resources piece away from budget and facilities, because I think it needs its own span of attention. And I want to use all the resources of the Board of Trustees. If we had two other members, they would fit in as either chairs or members of these committees, but we don't have them yet. So we'll keep working on that. Any questions or comments from anyone I mentioned? If not, that's what we're doing with committees, and we'll move now to reports from committees, some of which have met and some of which have not. <coughs> so let's start with curriculum success, student success and diversity, uh, Candace. Okay. So we did meet this last month. Um, there are three items that we reviewed for, for board approval. Um, and, and I know that um, Eric has some notes as well. Would you like to, to start with your notes or should I go through the items that? Yep, absolutely, I can do that. Sure. And we also have each of the representatives here too that yes. can speak in more detail to them. There are three items for the board's approval here to, to vote on. Uh, the first of which is related to our law enforcement training academy and the use of space uh, with Erie County Air Cultural and Dean Martinez is here. If there's any additional comments or questions about the, the agreement to use that space. There's uh, executive summaries, of course, are in our materials. We've seen them. Pages 23, 24, and 26 for these three. They look pretty straightforward to me. We'll vote on them collectively. Okay. okay. Uh, the second item is related then to our continued um, partnership and training that we do with AAA um, and driver education. Uh, we also have Colleen Reedy here to answer additional questions if needed. And then lastly is with regards to our Perkins grant um, and universal design. And we do have Kathy Clesto here um, for any additional questions if we did. I thought that was very interesting, that Perkins grant. And it's funded completely by outside money, so that makes it particularly easy to embrace. Any questions on any of those three? Um, I read them all and found, you know, found favor with all of them myself. If not, then let's uh, take a motion, please, for the approval of all three presented items as listed in our agenda. I'll make that motion. Thanks, Candace. Second? Second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? <coughs> if not, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed. Those three items are approved, and thank you. Anything else from the committee itself? I just want to make two, two quick notes. Um, we did have a discussion uh, during that, that meeting about using specific, or particularly the, the driver's ed program to help increase the awareness of ECC's and uh, SUNY areas and institution for, for those um, participating in that program. So we are using this to you know really think about how we, we continue to, to draw interest to SUNY area. Um, and then just it just as a minor note, Jeff, I know that you sent around or, or maybe it was Kelly, someone sent around a great story about um, ECC in the news recently. Uh, there was a, another story that was tangentially related, but it did include some really great photographs of the um, law enforcement training facilities mm -hmm. down at South Campus. I don't know if anyone saw that. So I just raise it because it's tangentially related, but a really great, um, and, you know, again, photographs of, of the facilities and SUNY Erie and how important it is to the community in these various ways. So just wanted to make a note of that and, and be concerned about it. Thanks, and just so that everyone in the room knows, we, we've asked our officer in charge to coordinate closely with each of the committee chairs to determine the appropriate level of frequency of the meeting of these committees. There's no mandate that it be monthly. If there ca it can be reports at the board. We did not meet. We have nothing to report. That's fine. But if there are action items, take them up, meet as you need to, and report on them is the idea. Okay? Uh, anything else further, Candace? All right. Then we'll move on to uh, our uh, budget audit and facilities chair, Ken Cruley. Again, thank you. thank you, Ken, for taking that chair. Thank you. Uh, we have three items uh, for, for uh, board approval. Um, One of which I believe is being t uh, tabled, yeah. right? We, the, the, uh, is the Huron thing we're. Yes, yes, yes. We're per discussion yesterday, that's not quite right, item Which one. one. So number one. Okay. So two and three are actually coming forward. Okay. One we might need to table. The, uh, the dishwasher lease is just a, a renewal uh, that we use in the uh, culinary program, um, $144 a month, not a, not a big deal. 
And uh, then the human resource stuff, which uh, we'll hand off next month, uh, is just uh, a handful of uh, uh, resignations and, uh, and a couple of uh, job switches. Um, so uh, but a very important one, yes. Adrian Rannick. Um, let's, we'll talk about Adrian in a second, because that, that's an important yeah. what's going on there. Uh, but let's do this. Let's first have a motion uh, on the recommendation of our officer in charge to defer and table discussion and action on the Huron matter uh, that's listed as item one. So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Uh, any, uh, any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 And uh, any opposed? We'll defer that and await further guidance from the officer in charge. Thank you. On item two, the dishwasher lease, let's vote on that uh, as well and, and clear that item and then we'll move to a discussion of uh, Dr. Rack. With the lease, uh, my assessment of it, it seemed to make sense financially because of, surprisingly buying a new dishwasher is extremely expensive. And <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. But I get it, it's an it's a institutional setting and high volume and so forth. So I think we have to take the recommendation of our folks closest to the ground uh, I don't know, Adiam, if you're that person or who made the report, but when I read it, I said, well, this does seem to make sense. You guys all agree? And I think that's the strong recommendation yes. from staff, right? Yes, it so is. So sure. let's then, if, unless we have further discussion, let's take a motion to approve the dishwasher lease uh, modification. Second. Thank you. And second. And uh, any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? <coughs> that's approved as presented. Now. Human resources, uh, just again stepping back and maybe to, for some, some of the newer or at least Ken's benefit. When, when it comes to human resources agenda for approval, we, I, the, the notion is that at the senior executive staff level, whether interim or permanent, the board weighs in on that and makes an informal approval of that. That's why it's on the uh, appro approval list as item three, instead of just being the I normal wasn't clear list. On that. I, I thought it was just information. Yeah, it's, it's because of the SES aspect of it, okay. senior executive staff. And that's important. So uh, how you want to handle yes, this sure. as yes, between sure. the two of you, I think we'd love to hear what the concept is sure. here in your mind. So on page uh, 36, we have two, um, uh, two for focus. One, uh, we have two faculty uh, who are taking leave of absence uh, for a year. So we need that approved. Uh, Renee Gauss, uh, who is our um, Dean of Engineering Technology right now. Mm. Um, and then Adrian Rannick. Uh, uh, is also uh, taking a leave uh, of absence for a year, so we need that. Um, the second part, Adrian Rannick is taking the interim uh, vice president of academic affair from teaching, um, and part of the decision why uh, I move forward in the college is that we really need a focus on that side of the college to make sure that we really are doing the good work, the academic uh, excellent work that you saw today uh, with our students and we want to focus. Um, and to have someone, Adrian had been with the college for us uh, since 95? 95. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so he has an extraordinary experience with the college both indirectly and directly with our students, same uh, with our faculty and staff. Um, one of the things that I think there's a lot of good things, uh, excellent things that Adrian brings to the table, but one is data-driven and solution-oriented. And right now, as you know, our college need that. That's the direction that all of us are going. And what we need in the academic area is that. And so uh, Adrian has been working with our VP of enrollment uh, on a regular basis to make sure that our academic uh, faculty are moving in that same direction. Very passionate about accuracy, advisement. Uh, so I am thrilled to have him part of the uh, leadership team in that uh, in the direction that our college is going. So uh, I'm thrilled to have him here with us. And before we turn to Adrian, I, I just want to underscore that the way you frame that is very important for the board. We have been uh, t discussing at our retreat the need to evaluate everything at the college okay. in a very data-driven way. Okay. Um, you know, the, the answers are not easy in some cases, but we've got to have as our touchstone careful analysis, thoughtful discussion, and fact-based analysis. So I think what you're saying is, you know, consistent with that, and we appreciate that. Absolutely. And it's a bigger um, sort of project that we've been uh, working on, on the realignment of the college and staffing is one of them and we talked about that during our retreat so this is what we're doing so we're not done yet we're constantly going back and reevaluating. but I think this is an important piece for the college to move forward and do it now and like they said Adrian brings a lot of wealth experience both in the outside the classroom that is going to be key for us 
Well, I can certainly testify to that because I do tune in to the Senate meetings every month, and Colleen does a fantastic job yes. leading those and bringing everyone forward in a very thoughtful way. To, it's always very impressive. But among the voices that almost consistently come forward in a very impressive way is always Adrian. There's some committee he's chairing, there's something he's reporting on, there's something that, you know, and sometimes it, it might be something with, you know, well, gee, it's something we have to deal with. You know, but it's always presented in a way that's very constructive, very thoughtful. And I, you know, took notice early on and said, hmm, this, this person is really a strong, you know, helpful individual in terms of going forward. So when you um, mentioned this idea, uh, the board members, again, we just came off our retreat, so we had a chance to talk about stuff like this in some detail. And Adrian, we're really glad that you're willing to somewhat disrupt your professional path in life. You are a professor here. You've got a portfolio that you enjoy, and now you're taking on this responsibility. So may we hear from you or, on all of this? <coughs> I really have much to add to that. I, I appreciate all the very nice comments said by Dr. Sagan and yourself, Chairman Stone. Um, I'm looking forward to the challenge. I really do hope that there's um, more that we can do here, um, bringing my knowledge of, and my relationships with the unions, my understanding of labor law and the contract and things like that to bear um, on SES so that we can do things correctly. Yeah. That's really the biggest thing I'm looking to do is to, uh, to cut down no offense to the attorneys in the room, on the amount of litigation. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Not that I'm afraid of litigation, I never have been, but you know, we can do without it and focus on other more productive aspects of uh, our community here in the country. Good lawyers like to avoid litigation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure you found it interesting with committee arrangements, and I think I saw Amanda nodding as you were speaking, and I think it's important for the two of you to immediately <coughs> get together, establish a good relationship. Because you're, you're going to be able to help us. Uh, none of us like to have the college in a situation where <coughs> someone feels they need to file a grievance over something. That's almost by definition a failure at that point. Something has gone wrong. And it, you can't avoid them completely in a, in a highly organized environment, but we should strive to minimize those situations. Starting with the board, the officer in charge, the leadership of the college, people like you who have come forward out of the faculty. And you're not the only one. Erica's here, Kathy. You know, some good leadership for the college has come from the faculty. And um, Andy has always been constructive as well, and Patty on the administrator side. So we're trying to bring everyone together in a way that you know, helps us deal with these awful challenges that we have so that we can steep, continue having success stories like the students we heard from at Andy Sacco's breakfast yesterday, or these folks who were here today, or the culinary folks who were here a month ago. Mm -hmm. you know, Never forget them. Uh, Colleen starts every meeting talking about them in some fashion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. So uh, those are my thoughts. But we're, we're glad that you said yes to this because I, I, we thought the idea was good. We endorse it. Amanda's excited, and uh, hopefully we can make some, some healthy progress here. Thank you. Thank you. Other trustees, any thoughts or comments before we vote on that? Um, I just learned I need to leave a little early today. Is there so probably around like ten thirty? I might be able to squeeze out till about ten forty-five. I think we're okay. Perfect. Yeah. So let's uh, then we we're tabling here. On let's. I think I took a motion to table that earlier. Uh, the dishwasher we passed, and now uh, let's have uh, if any further discussion, we'll take it. But if not, a motion to approve the human resources agenda. And before we do that, let me just ask. I, I, we've talked about Adrian, but Renee is also leaving, and she's not taking a position. Yeah, she's dean, the senior executive. Yeah, no, not senior, but dean of engineering technology. Is that, oh, so she's moving to okay. Dean of engineering technology. So you see the proposed job yep. group on page thirty-six, yep. and you're con you're content with that? Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. I haven't had as much direct involvement with Renee. You're right. But she's great. Okay. She she comes from the um, health science, so there's a lot of correlation to help our health science and engineering technology. So she brings a lot of wealth experience from that. Uh, she has an MBA, so there's a lot of correlation in there. So we're glad to have Renee. I think part of what our, our goal is to make sure that if there's talent within the college is to be able to do that and get that talent and give people the challenge and the opportunity to grow within the college. And we have individuals who are very committed to the college and willing to. So we want to identify those talent and give individuals that opportunity. And Renee is an example. Of that. I think I was a little confused because there's two under leave of absence Correct. and only one under change of job status and Adrian's under both but Renee's only under leave of absence so it made me think she's not going to be here. No, no. She's the, she the leave be. of absence is for just the deed, yes. Okay, okay. So that's, with that clarification, a motion mm -hmm. to approve? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. 
Uh, any further discussion? If none, then all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? We approve. Congratulations. Thank you. And Renee. And Renee. Uh, who's Absolutely. not here today, right? That's I'm not missing her. Okay. No. But that's good too, as well. Um, so we've gotten taken care of that. The management letter, uh, I referred to you already, page 37 through 40. That is a good piece of reading, and not just for the trustees. For anyone who has a significant stake, and that would be all of us in the college, page 39 of the materials, which, um, Kelly, if you could just make sure to make that available to a broad array, anyone here I think would benefit by just reading, seeing the enrollment situation. We're all familiar with it, but when you get a single page where it's all represented and what's going on financially and with enrollment, this is the atmosphere we're all trying to work in, so let's all understand it. So, Kelly, if you could spread that around to those in attendance at the meeting, please. Um, and the, the draft financial statements, uh, we heard Carl's report on those. Facility rentals and waivers. Oh, I'm sorry, Kat, I'm taking your, your items here <laughs> out of force of habit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Chair the budget committee for two or three years, that's what happens. I warn you. We can, we can get to the uh, Go ahead. budget presentation. Uh, Arlene, you want to join us, please? Yes. And we didn't, you didn't see anything either on supplier or facilities rentals that you know, we need to bring forward. Yeah. Okay. I'm just waiting for Bob oh, okay. to pull up my presentation, so. This is item 10, you okay? We won't lose well, money. Well, oh, thanks that for comes. pulling this one up. Actually, um, this would be my third time presenting this presentation <laughs> to the board. Um, some but subset. I do appreciate the opportunity and I want to inform the rest of the individuals in this room and uh, those that are watching. Um, so I've updated this presentation actually to include some additional slides. Basically what we are going to discuss in this presentation is primarily uh, the topics that are going to be covered are the enrollment history and projections, current budget, projected actuals for 22-23, as well as prior year figures, which were also covered by the auditors and Jeff. Um, uh, included in as additional slides is cost and affordability, something that the board inquired last uh, at the retreat. Um, some information on student aid, Again, some opportunities, challenges, and then, um, then where the state budget is, and then just some highlights from the SUNY proposed budget, and what are our next steps. So the slide that you see here, these numbers uh, were provided by uh, SUNY. This basically represents an overview of the current enrollment, enrollment trends for SUNY Erie. And as you can see from 2017-18, uh, there has been um, a trending decline, especially in the years of 1920, 2021, as well as 21, 22 during the COVID years. And um, the percentage that you see, it's also the decline year over year. Uh, we do hope that we will remain steady or, um, in the upcoming years from 24, 25, all the way through 29, 30. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, slide also represents, uh, is a continuation of the, the slide before. Um, basically, it just represents the net change of actual uh, enrollment numbers from 17, 18, all the way through 22, 23. We did, did see a decline of 31.3% in total FDEs. We also project between 22 and 23 to 29, 30, an additional 6.1% drop in total FTEs. And then total from 17 all the way through 29, 30, a total decline of 35.5%. Next slide. We did cover this. Um, and then um, basically this, this chart just represents what is happening. 
The first column technically shows the budget, projected actuals for 22-23, and as well as the actuals of 21-22. Um, we did build the budget based on a deficit because at the time we knew we were not getting any stimulus funds. We still had all these operational expenses that we needed to address in order to um, turn this institution around. Projected actuals. Um, Projected actuals, you can see when you compare the projected actuals for 22-23, there's a significant swing from a deficit of $8.9 million to a surplus of $6.7 million, which then uh, basically adds to the unreserved fund balance. And we are projecting to be at $21.2 million by 831-23 whereas initially we were projecting to be at only five million dollars um, and this is strictly due to um, the layoffs that happen at 831.22. And while that seems very encouraging based on where we've been with our reserve, we still have to note that we're in a structurally imbalanced situation even after the moves we've made yes. and we're so reliant on the federal stimulus help that has now ended that we, we have to take a pause and examine where we are in the absence of that and in light of what is happening at the state budget. So until that clarifies, we should not be saying, hmm, we have a nice large fund balance again, wonderful. I'm afraid, you know, to put it that way. But we just have to, there's more moving parts, more picture to clarify. But the, uh, it's better to have some something to work with depending on how these decisions are made. We also, though, have to look forward, right. not just 23-24, because those enrollment numbers uh, are troubling because they're steady and they're low. Yeah. Uh, so uh, even though we have a fund balance that's pretty decent, a little bit under our projection, uh, if we uh, go out the next three years, uh, we're going to probably be eating into that, that number. Maybe significantly. So the, yeah. it, as much as the, the next budget is important, the three after that also we have to take some sort of a look. Good. Next slide, please. So this slide, this is the projected budget for 23-24. Um, the area in white uh, these are the numbers that are also on the previous slide. We just brought them the current budget and actual projected actuals. And then on the gray section, uh, this, these are the data that um, we are seeing for the proposed budget for 23-24. We are seeing a three, we are actually included in this a 3% decline in our uh, enrollment. And then uh, we did provide two options, one with a potential of 3% increase in tuition rate versus a 0% tuition rate. Um, if we uh, do not increase tuition, we are looking to use roughly 95,000 or of our unreserved fund balance. Um, so with that being said, if we, if uh, if the board, if we decide to increase tuition um, for every 1%, the college generates roughly $300,000. Um, but at this point in time, the projected fund balance at 831 24 would be $22 million if there is a 3% rate increase versus $21 million if there is no rate increase. We are still uh, doing a lot of analysis to determine that, and we cannot conclude any increases unless the state budget is actually approved and adapted. So we have we should hear sometime next week, and that should clarify things a little bit more of how the 23-24 budget will actually look like for our institution. I, I think uh, we have to be careful. I don't think the budget will be done in Albany next week. Uh, it's going to drag for a while. Usually, I think they are required to actually enact the budget by yeah. April 1st, um, but we'll see. It's gone into May uh, mm -hmm. sometimes. So, oh, uh, that it, doesn't help really, us. It's <laughs> really, uh, and with the way things are going, it's frankly not that good for community colleges. Uh, the governor didn't propose any increase in the funding for the community colleges. Uh, she 
they're basically telling us grow your enrollment. Well, of course, mm. we want to grow in our enrollment. But uh, and uh, uh, the SUNY projections, uh, they asked for extra money, uh, but SUNY is sort of <laughs> not a player now. Mm. Players are are uh, <coughs> two men and a woman in the, in the two women and one man in the room. Uh, right now we're going to decide that and because of other issues that have nothing to do with the <coughs> colleges this thing is going to drag for a while the bail reform and other issues are going to stretch it out so I, I I wouldn't be optimistic that there'll be a budget in the next few days I would think that I agree with that based on what I'm hearing as well and uh, that would be something that'll be in the <coughs> talk to the mm -hmm. Chancellor about next week yes there are some potential bright spots in the one house bills um, even even the governor at least kept the 100% floor. I mean, there are things that are positive, but until that clarifies and the whole thing stops moving, it's hard for us to frame a budget beyond what Art has been able to do. Well, we'll just do the best that we can with what we have available mm -hmm. at this point in time, and we move forward. And as far as the tuition increase is concerned, that has not been decided or even seriously discussed mm -hmm. by the board as yet. We know that that's a decision we have to make before the budget is presented to us, but uh, last year we did raise tuition 3%. The three years before that we had no tuition increase. Correct. So that's just a little historical context as we approach that decision. Uh, this is a new slide that was not presented before, but I thought it would be beneficial to inform the board. Um, so the National College Attainment Network uh, raised some financial concerns which are preventing some students from accessing higher education and in particular those that are low income and first generation college attendees. Um, this organization actually works to promote equity in college and student success so they did an analysis of affordability comparing every institution nationwide uh, those that students that are actually on campus versus if they live with family and those that actually live uh, without family but off campus um, so for SUNY Erie I actually worked with um, Josh Sager from um, the current interim CFO at SUNY he has been a tremendous help to our institution and actually help guiding me um, to lead, to inform the board and, and, and the community as much as I can about our current situation. Uh, so these numbers uh, are definitely verified by him. Um, and the data that was provided for SUNY Erie. So the question is, is SUNY Erie even affordable for our students? The, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, so these numbers are actually based on 2021 first time full time resident undergraduates. So our student body, the enrollment, students that live off campus co with family are at 37.8% off-campus not with family are at roughly 56.1 percent and unknown is 6.1 percent because sometimes students the data can be convoluted or they don't report the right information so what is the gross cost basically cost of attendance to attend stu uh, SUNY Erie this is basically tuition <coughs> fees books supplies and the weighted average for room and board and other expenses they consider this so total cost, um, if you, and if you can see the chart to the right, and it starts with total cost for off campus and with family, it's roughly $9,133. Cost living off campus, not with family, you, students are looking at $15,633,000. However, total resources, this is then you move on the middle section which is the resources that students may get uh, this includes the average state federal and local institutional aid that we are looking at tap and pell um, and the average is roughly seven thousand um, dollars federal loans um, around uh, thirty eight hundred dollars 
federal work study and summer wages. So total resources that students may potentially get is roughly $18,648. So then the affordability calculation, what it does, it takes just the net difference, right? Total resources less the gross cost. And SUNY Erie looks that for students that live off campus with family, they are looking at savings of not they can afford up the savings basically of 9515 versus off campus and not with family then they're looking at three thousand um, dollars in savings next slide please uh, do you guys have any questions in this slide because i did not cover this one previously so next slide please. Love, yes. um, uh, do you have numbers on uh, the uh, tuition uh, compared to Pell and TAP as far as students, how many are actually paying out of pocket and how yeah. many are, are covering at least their tuition with that stuff? I'm going to cover that right after okay. this slide. Okay. Yes, Thank for you. sure. Because, um, uh, yeah. It uh, is very so important when it comes to the tuition increase decision because we have to see how painful it actually is at the student level. Uh, so this next slide basically lists um, Erie Community College at the very top and then the surrounding colleges and the positive shows that it is affordable to attend any, any of these institutions and the negative sign shows that it's not affordable if a student chooses any other location. So if you see, they also have students that live on campus, which SUNY Erie does not have any students, and then off campus with family and off campus not with family. And you can see literally SUNY Erie being very affordable to our students. And I think we just have to focus on how do we get these students? How do we reach out to them? Versus other institutional, whether they are public, a two-year institution in the area versus a four-year, um, uh, for profit um, or private actually so I'm not seeing a lot of um, so it, it actually makes me think about um, how they're discussing the rate the tuition rate increase and what is that doing to our students nationwide so next slide Okay, so I tried to provide as much information as I could in one slide, that is. Um, so this is the student aid um, that I was looking at. To start with, uh, the, the recipient uh, dependent is basically on student income. There's like an index calculation when, when any student enrolls and that is basically the FAFSA. Pell, Pell is available to every student versus TAP and Excelsior. It's only available to New York State residents. 50% of matriculated undergraduate full-time students have their tuition liability fully covered by various grants and scholarships. So 50%, 50% you said yes. 50? Yes. Okay. The other 50, it depends. Some receive portions of grants and scholarships, some pay out of pocket, some um, take out loans and then some just don't pay and then they are they won't be able to actually register if they do not pay their outstanding bill so it, it just this one we have to do a little bit more work on on that 50 percent who um, are not indicated as getting the the, the, the funding um, in terms of if students are actually applying right we know that not all the time students apply or understand that so I think that's another um, area that Art and the team will dig in a little bit to make sure that every time our students apply that they are applying for financial aid when they're so we really need to look at that because I thought when we were talking with Art about this that was a little bit a huge percentage that are not eligible for uh, for financial aid so we got to do a little bit more data on that. There's definitely room I agree <coughs> with Audium as we sat down and reviewed these slides with because without her permission I, I don't like to just present um, Looking at SUNY Erie versus other community colleges, we do fall right in the range of 50% as tuition being fully covered by grants and scholarships. Some other institutions have more, 
and there, there's definitely room for us to dig in deeper and find all the resources available and just uh, present them to our students if they do qualify. Um, the sure. chart basically, mm -hmm. this is the degree seeking programs. It's driven, it's uh, coming from 21 22 year. 67.2% of our students do receive um, Pell versus 37.6 receive TAP and then just a small portion actually do get the, the Excelsior. So Arda, just a quick question yes. on those numbers. Those that receive, is that receive at any dollar amount? So in other words, that may not be the full tuition coverage, it could just be a portion of that? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, so there are, there's an index where they take the income uh, per family and then they determine your eligibility for FAFSA in the first place. This is just any student that is a degree seeking, basically, um, that do get either a portion or the maximum of okay. any of these grants. So, so 67% is not necessarily 67% of students who receive full Correct. HEL funding that covers full tuition. Correct. Okay. <coughs> right, let me just ask you where you are in your presentation wrong. because we do have a couple of approval items. How close are you? Uh, very close. Okay. Um, very close. So yes. Yeah. So just one more thing in here that I did notice that just to keep something that may help us uh, for a federal Pell Award, the eligibility, um, the, the increase for Pell has actually is going to increase by $500 for year 23-24. So students may get some additional aid. Um, next slide, basically, this is just the opportunities and the challenges that we did cover in our previous uh, meetings. Uh, we are looking at uh, hopefully maintaining the funding floor that literally generates $5.7 million in benefits for our institution. Staffing opportunities, these are the full-time employees that we were at 831.21 versus 831.22, and then you're looking at what, as of 1-1. One, one. Uh, a significant savings from just full-time positions. Uh, under opportunities, uh, we have leased the space in building one and six. We are looking at $400,000 in revenue, which are not part of those uh, um, calculations in our previous slides. Uh, so that's going to affect the budget a little bit. And then just some opportunities. We do have some short-term and long-term plans with right-sizing, which the institution has already taken steps, realigning our programs and students and reallocating. So there's a lot of work that we're doing internally um, in working with some short-term and long-term plans. Challenges, we are looking at ITS costs. You know, um, this is just for optimizing workday. We don't necessarily see these costs staying consistent long term. This is just in the shortcoming years to really offset, um, get workday up to date. And then um, we have some challenges with employment levels. This is the inflation that's just beyond our control at this point in time, but hopefully, I'm hopeful that SUNY Erie will get some uh, support from the state <coughs> in this regard. Um, and then, um, the other challenge that we are seeing is just basically the declines in enrollment between now and 29 and 30. Um, oh, next slide. This is the side where one house built. This is where we're at. We're just waiting to hear for the enacted budget. Uh, next slide. Uh, SUNY proposed budget, I've included just some highlights. This is actually on the packet for anyone that is interested. This is just what SUNY proposed for um, for support and um, continued investment in enrollment, academic programs, and operational efficiencies. SUNY Erie actually qualified from the $60 million. We actually did get $2.8 million. We have a plan in place. We just have to execute it now. The stated calculation, this is also the funding floor. Uh, we are hopeful that we want to keep it that way, as same at the very least, same as the payment that we received last year, because if we base it but per FDE, we are looking at losing $5.7 million. And then they just proposed some support to combat not only the salaries, but also the um, the ongoing operational inflation and costs. And then last but not least, the capital budget requests. We did submit three proposals to SUNY Erie, which I believe are approved. And then, next slide. Uh, I just wanted to show like a little comparison. 
uh, of the executive budget versus one house proposal. I believe the agenda has the one house proposal um, included in your agenda if you want to look at it in more depth. It just goes to show that how the three branches kind of uh, review the whole New York State budget and then they either agree or disagree in in support and then just the next steps we are looking now that you said we are looking at the enacted budget being as far as May I'm not really sure if I should reach out to the county and perhaps just delay our submittal um, for SUNY Erie to the county uh, We'll know more, Arda, in about yeah. a week. Yep. Once so. April 1st comes, they'll say something, and yeah. we'll have a better sense of it. But unless you guys have any 1st. questions, I'm good to go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't mean to rush you. Didn't mean to rush you. We had heard that presentation at the Budget Committee in great depth and at the trustee retreat last week. So this was really as much as anything for others in the room. A couple new slides for the trustees. It's important, I think, for us to focus on the questions Ken and Candace were touching on. How would a tuition increase actually affect our students? I'm not saying it doesn't. Mm -hmm. We have to understand the extent to which. It may not be 3% extra money coming out of every student's pocket. It's not. And we knew that last year when we raised. So we have to think about it, and that's an important element of our discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay? I am going to, thank you, Arda. Thank you. I'm going to jump, if I may, Ken, over just to our action item before we lose quorum. And that is to uh, ask Adiam, I think you could tell us what, what we're doing here. We've looked at these, but basically what we had to do when we rejiggered the committees, per my discussion earlier, and our various yeses that we all said, uh, that triggered some changes to the board um, bylaws, our board of trustee bylaws, and a waiver of a 30-day notice period, because we've thoroughly discussed these and we're all comfortable with it. So that is what is uh, for board's approval item one, two, and three under report of chair. Adam, do you want to add anything about these? I mean, they're basically clearing the way for us to do yep. the new committee structure, yes, which is what we want. So uh, if I may, I'd like a, an approval of items 6A, 1, 2, and 3 uh, under report of chair, general report for our, uh, actually just the clean version, 2 and 3. Uh, the red line is there for our information and the bylaws waiver. If I may have a motion to facilitate our committee restructure. So moved. Thanks. Second? I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? <coughs> if none, then all aye. In favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? Those are approved. Excellent. I've got to go to the policy. Well, let's make sure, Ken, are you done with your yes. items of information? Yes, I am. The only thing that I would say, just out of habit, LMH, LMHF looks fine, more positive there. <coughs> We're not seeing any significant decline there. Arda did a good job. There's more budget-related stuff in this package of material than there normally is, and rightly so, because we're entering the season. We've got the state budget happening. It is good reading to see what the governor wanted, what the Senate wants, what the assembly response is, and what SUNY wants. And it all, it's hard to predict, though, where we're going to wind up. Some bright spots, the 100% is really important, really important, the 100% floor. That is masking the fiscal effects of our decline in enrollment, and we have to realize that. Um, so policy and let's see policy and governance we have some mm -hmm. approval items yeah. yeah so we have the tuition liability and refund policy uh, we basically discussed um, you know at what point uh, should students be um, charged for late tuition we discussed uh, what other colleges and what other school student or schools were doing uh, any comments um, no we talked about it um, as a previous uh, administration, we charge our students uh, and then we would drop them before the start of the semester. So uh, we've since corrected that, but we're now looking further to make sure uh, that our students are experiencing the same thing that is happening in other community colleges and four-year schools um, so that you know they pick their schedule in, let's say, April. They still have their schedule in September. There's no surprises and no unexpected fees and things like that uh, for our students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so there are three items that are up for the, the board's uh, vote today. Uh, there is the tuition liability and refund. This was a relatively minor um, change with a few different terms and really putting it under the registrar's office. There's also the grade um, and academic standings um, policy. This has been vetted through our academic standards committee. Uh, we had a vote 
now came to here and it was also discussed at the Senate and now it's coming to the board for official approval. Um, and then there's lastly the grading change policy, um, similar as well with then the, uh, the language being changed here. With regards to that comment on the amounts and then with regards to registration, these are things that are actually going to be discussed at our upcoming OC. Mm -hmm. All right. Dr. Sagai, you are comfortable with Absolutely. all three of these items? Yes. Any other comments or questions based on what we've seen? If not, then let's have a motion, please, for the approval of all of the three items, C1, 2, and 3, uh, under policy and governance. So moved. Thank you. And second? I'll second. second. Okay, thanks. Uh, any further discussion? If none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And aye. opposed? Those are approved. Thank you for the work that went into evaluating that, Eric. Thanks for presenting that. All right. Um, let's just make sure where you know where we are. The information on the minutes from the, your committee, Melody, is there. Mm -hmm. uh, no further action, I presume, needed there. Strategic Planning and Assessment and Technology. Chair Phillips is not here for either of those, but all we have is informational uh, items in the form of the minutes from their committee. So it's always good to hear from Carrie and what that committee is doing. And she's been doing some very thoughtful work there. Uh, but we don't have any action item today other than to accept as, as given to us these minutes. Len Lanahan, Trustee Lanahan is in Florida, I believe, or in Albany actually today. Uh, so he's not at this meeting. Um, Mike Barone, do you, I thought of something like that. Yeah. Yes. Do you care to comment on anything on the marketing side? Just, you know, Sure. It ties a little bit to your area as well, so. Ab absolutely, and this will take care of the reports later on in the meeting as right. well. Um, <coughs> uh, you know, of, of note for, for the group, that that would be a particular note, I should say. Uh, we began running some open house ads. We've hopefully seen them on uh, Channel 2 and 7 in the morning. They've been running just uh, five, five second bump ads leading into coming back from it commercial, that sort of a thing. Uh, but the real highlight is we've, we've received official approval to begin uh, working with our media management partner. And as you'll recall, that means we'll be allowed, we'll be able to uh, start digitally advertising in an effective, strategic way, uh, really for the first time in the college's history. Um, and so uh, we literally received the uh, final executed document on Tuesday. So uh, it's an extremely exciting opportunity for the college. Um, just to give you a little bit of reference here, the SUNY system began an ad campaign at the start of the month to help um, just can't statewide with some affordability uh, messaging and, and um, completion type messaging and that sort of thing, access. Um, aside from a little bit of outdoor tactics that they've chosen, every other tactic they're using, nearly 100%, is digital. So that's where it's, it's, the world has clearly moved and, and we're thrilled to be able to start doing that. Um, you know, uh, we, we're continuing to use our own media channels as effectively as possible, our social media channels in particular, our, as, as well as our website and, and email. We've also launched um, a, an e-newsletter that's now going out to the campus at the start of each week, letting people know about uh, events and, and other activities that are happening, um, uh, really trying to establish a, a very positive tone in, in that communication, uh, creating more of a single campus feel and tone and, and culture. Um, had a couple of excellent um, articles that appeared in the media recently, one of which literally um, was in support of the, the legislation that was passed uh, for our nursing program, which was tremendous, and we were happy to be uh, part of that. Also doing some great work with Connie Reedy on the workforce development initiatives um, that are that are for that are ongoing, um, and, and really those are, those are I would say the, the big highlights. Everything else is in your packet. I sent you a note the other day, Mike, and I just I think I speak for everybody. It's terrific to see what folks all, all around the room are trying to do to frame some of our programs in a very positive way. I'm just tired of dealing with the storm and <laughs> issues and <laughs> any other you know, items that detract from what we're doing here, which is listening to students like this morning, right. making sure they have a path, helping create a world where they can move forward. And uh, to see the number of articles, it's been three or four, starting with the, the one across the street, mm -hmm. down in the city, mm -hmm. 
the uh, simulation, uh, just the, the, the nursing piece, several others that, you know, it, your work is showing. Thank you. Very good. Um, let me just make sure I haven't skipped over anything here, folks. We're at report of chair, and I can, I can go, I think, fairly quickly through that. I usually keep just a running list of things that are on my mind as, as for fellow trustees and attendees, and uh, here they are in no, no particular order. Um, I continue to have uh, frequent meetings and calls with senior executive staff and our officer in charge. Uh, that just comes with the territory of being the board chair, and it's happening. Uh, Every day, virtually, we have some sort of conversation and frequent meetings when I'm out here talking to someone. And I find those to be extremely helpful, and they do inform the discussion that we have here at the table and at our retreat and other places. Claudia and I thank you for making sure those happen on a regular basis, not just here within the college, but also with the county executive. With Yesterday, I was at NYSET for their... Um, for their legislative breakfast at the invitation of Andy Sacco. Uh, we've had meetings with Patty Lacido, who is, as you know, heads the bargaining unit for the administrators and was central to the nursing thing. I don't think I saw Patty come in today, just standing around quickly. But I was kind of hoping she would be here because it was very exciting what was going on with the nursing simulation mm -hmm. legislation. That is one thing that happened extremely quickly in New York State, almost surprisingly. Mm -hmm. I'm glad it wasn't linked to the budget. Apparently, it either it is, it's coming in the budget and it's been agreed to, or it's, it's happening in any event. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, I do want to mention, uh, in greeting Ken, yet again, uh, Danise Wilson, of course, has left our board you know, at the expiration of her term and carry over time. And we are going to be talking about Denise, Denise and thanking her for her exemplary work for the college over the course of seven years. Mm -hmm. I don't think said this to someone yesterday, I don't think I've ever met anyone more student-centric than Denise Wilson. And we all could take great lesson there uh, with respect to how, how we should approach our jobs here. Um, so Denise will be in the mix next month, <coughs> April. So I would encourage everyone here who uh, was influenced or helped by Denise to come. Uh, we'll have you know, a, a typical send-off of, of a former trustee who's, who's really worked hard for the college. and. Uh, we're just kind of accommodating her schedule by not doing that last month or this. March 22nd, we had a board retreat here in this room for a long time. Uh, it was good, at least four or five hours we talked and addressed a, a huge variety of issues uh, with some very good outside assistant, Dr. Casey, and give me the last name, I'm trying to... Kerbell. Yes, uh, who has been helping us the senior executive staff, officer in charge in particular, the board from SUNY. She is an extremely thoughtful and experienced person. And she has run three colleges and has come and gave us a lot of really good concrete advice on how we ought to conduct ourselves as a board. Some of it actually you've seen reflected in discussion so far today. Um, but I think she, you know, the main thing that I took away from it is to make sure, and, and we all feel this, but we want to make sure everyone in the college community knows this, that the board is you know, very comfortable with the role of you know, being here, being trustees, volunteer trustees. And it's an ongoing thing with the board. Composition changes, but hopefully you always have a good, thoughtful group of people. And I feel very happy with the board right now. And um, whatever may be going on with personnel or leadership or anything, there's always that, at least, if you can have a thoughtful board, was her point, that is feel comfortable really being in charge of policy making and overall direction for the college, you are halfway home. Mm -hmm. Because a lot follows from that. So I think we all listened to that and tried to be mindful of our appropriate role, not to run the college or interfere in daily activities of very empowered and good people, but rather to you know, make sure that we were there as those policy settings, uh, pro providing that long-term view. Uh, as the shifting sands and the waves that happen in day-to-day -day operations of the college go on. So others may want to clarify that or correct that, but that's what I took from a very good, very good meeting uh, on the 22nd. We, we do that annually, and next, usually in February or March. We'll probably target March next year because I don't want it to interfere with budget too much. I mentioned nice at legislative breakfast yesterday. Andy Sacco was very kind uh, and called me and invited me to attend that. I said yes. 
Uh, Andy and I meet frequently. Um, he is a very thoughtful, respected voice from the faculty. Uh, he's been empowered with leadership of the FFECC, and we're always in communication. And I value that. Um, and I, uh, yesterday I was glad to attend uh, his breakfast out at the NYSET headquarters. Four or five students attended. Their stories were incredibly inspirational. I've heard those at the Senate, um, here in the boardroom, many other places, graduation. It was great. Um, one student was from Niger. You're from Brazil, Marcel. You know, coming from overseas to go to Erie Community College. And he just was taken under his wing by a professor who, he almost called it, he said, it's like my mother. It was so, <laughs> but that I think is what I want to encourage all of us. We talked about this at the retreat that, and C Colleen is relentless about this at Senate, that retention is, is the new enrollment, as we've said, right? You've yeah. got to, we've got to be thinking about what keeps those three or four and the four yesterday here. Mm -hmm. You know, are they experiencing some problem, something that Marcel has mentioned in a board meeting that's irritating? Can we solve that? And on an individual level, level faculty, SES, if you're encountering a student, do you say hello to them? Do you say, is there anything that's making you more inclined to leave here? If so, let's address it. You know, and I, I know this happens on a cellular level at the college, but boy, we can always really focus on that. Uh, very, very productive meeting yesterday. It was attended by representatives of state assembly people and senators, as well as at three actual members of the Erie County Legislature, mm -hmm. including the chairwoman, April Baskin, and Howard Johnson, and um, the other one will come to me in a moment. But it was very, very good to have, have them there listening very carefully. And we Adam and I and others in the college leadership are meeting with the legislature because of course they have questions and they're wondering, we almost had a meeting last week with the, the chairman of the uh, Community Enrichment Committee who oversees us. Did not have that meeting because of his schedule yesterday, but we were scheduled to do that, to talk about the whole migration question and you know how they make sure everyone's on the same page and understanding what we're doing about that. As for the presidential search, I know that's on people's mind. Uh, I would just start by saying this Board of Trustees is extremely comfortable with the leadership of the college around the edge of this room and in this chair and at the board level. And we are pursuing the question of the search and the process that we will follow. But it's a little bit more complicated than us just deciding what to do because there's SUNY involved and they uh, weigh in on the question. Um, and there's the legislature and the county executive. There's quite a lot of moving parts, actually, as to how we ought to conduct ourselves with respect to the search. It is going on, meetings are happening, we're evaluating uh, everything that's going on at the college. And just, I would say, I would leave it at the board is very comfortable where we are, we are progressing, and we will make a thoughtful decision about future leadership of SUNY Erie. Uh, I met with Bill Reuter, which I, again, greatly valued. We all know what Bill did when he was interim president or at, for a year and a half at a very difficult time with COVID, and he's been helping in numerous ways, Arda, Adiam, many, many others. So I just sat down with Bill for an hour and we talked about the college, and it was very helpful. Um, anyone who has a chance to talk to Bill Reuter about SUNY Erie, you should take advantage of it. He is a marvelous resource. Um, I also met with Patty Lacido and with Adiam and Patty Lacido, uh, and I mentioned about the nursing sim simulation, which was really exciting. She was heavily invested in that and feels it's crucial for the expansion of our nursing program. Um, and we talked about a, a variety of things, the nursing, uh, you know, grievances, the labor part, you know, and, and we're trying to have a good relationship there as we do with Andy and just, again, try to look forward, lean forward and move forward. Um, and Patty has been cooperative and helpful with that. Uh, and I had an individual coffee with her and then with Adiam as well. Uh, I mentioned the nursing simulation. And next month we have a joint meeting of our board and the foundation board happening at once. So we'll get a little bit of update from the foundation, uh, Mark Gollin, in terms of what they're doing exactly on the executive position. You may have talked about that when you report. Um, and we want to not lose sight of the fact that the foundation is out there trying to be constructive under Mark. A little bit eclipsed by all the events that we've had, you know, it's campus relocations, 
transitional leadership and a variety of other things. But that's important and we have to kind of, I think next month will be a good chance to refocus a little bit on the foundation, hear from Mark, hear from if they have a new executive person in place, hear from them and see what we're doing. Another piece of that is that if we had the other two trustees, we could do a little better job of figuring out who is the liaison from our board that sits on the foundation board, which is not really happening right now because we've got two vacancies and it may be that someone who fills one of those other two chairs would be the perfect person for the foundation liaison or dual membership. So it's, that's unfortunately a box that's unchecked and we continue to push on the two chairs. So if it goes long enough, uh, like it did like with the committee, I stopped I stopped waiting on the committee thing, and we got eight. We're going to spread eight around. But, but we, it's important. I think we've got to beef that up. That's been a little eclipsed in recent months. City campus. Uh, Paul, you're here, and Adi, I'm, I, I, we don't need to hear a, a long report about that, but I know it's going along, and, and college community may be interested in just hearing the latest on city um, and post office. The. Uh, well, the good news is it's progressing. Uh, in fact, I just had somebody send me a picture this morning that Grove Roof, Grove Roof is on site finally, because during the storm we had a large number of tiles blow off the roof, and because of the weather since then, whether it's high winds or whatever, they haven't been able to get on site. They're actually on site today replacing some of the tiles. Um, all contractors are addressing different areas of the building. We have plasters in there, a, a stole environmental, metro environmental, lakeside contracting. So they're they're pretty much hitting everything as they you know turn it over to each other. Um, I know there's some concern by staff as far as uh, asbestos or um, hazardous materials. I had Stoll actually send me something yesterday. The, the, the New York State guidelines are 10 times more st stringent than the national OSHA guidelines are. And they test every day inside the area of containment, which is really just more of a, a dust barrier, and then outside of the barrier, like in the atrium area. So the the building's being monitored pretty much every day of the week that they're on site. Um, there's really no hazard to anyone being in the building other than we want to keep them out of, our, out of the contractor's way. Um, as areas get turned over to us or a floor is going to be returned to us, we're going to remove the barriers. Um, right now they're concentrating on the uh, bookstore, the the bookstore, and I think it was 560 and 552. Those were two of the more heavily damaged rooms. They've also um, turned over the fourth floor restroom to Lakeside to start the reconstruction process. So everything's moving along. The City of Buffalo gave us some hard t a hard time about the dumpster placement, so we had to remove those from the Swan Street side. We had to put them over on the Ellicott Street side, which is a little further walk. And again, more as a security blanket. They extended the dust barrier to beyond the front doors, just so staff would feel a little more comfortable with people going and coming with trash and putting it in the dumpster. Even the dumpsters are required to be lined for asbestos or hazardous materials. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very, very stringent as to the requirements. Um, but getting back to the initial question, um, we we have a full complement of contractors on site. They, they're working together at Damon. And that, that was kind of one of the first things that we wanted to make sure that if if we're bringing in people that they, especially if they're working together somewhere else, that they work, they're you know working together cooperatively, and uh, we we have a, a basically a, a gang box meeting, for lack of a better description, every Wednesday morning at eight o'clock, where we go over what's going on this week, what we, what was accomplished in the past week, the uh, 
the plan is currently the for Metro they because they've already run into a few snags they're planning on being completely done with everything related to abatement by the uh, <coughs> early to mid part of June and Lakeside is pretty much following up right behind them so we're anticipating having a building back in July okay that was where I was going so it, we've been operating on the premise that we've lost post office for the semester Right, but we will have it back for the fall. Is that still accurate? Yes, I believe so. Yes. Definitely. Uh, and, and as I said, b because the abatement work is really the the thing that kind of keeps you away from areas. So as that work is done, we're we want to we're going to remove barriers because if you've been to city campus or been in any building at all, the atrium is loaded with furniture from you know this room or that room so we got to start sorting through it and trying to get the furniture and uh, contents back into people's offices or classrooms or labs and I was just on a f my computer this morning with our uh, insurance company providing them with the inventory that we feel needs to be replaced to try to get the go-ahead with that uh, which we're going to pursue anyway or proceed with anyways just because the if it's not going to be covered by Hanover which we fully expect it to be there's also the FEMA claim which we would incorporate it into so speaking of the FEMA claim I think the notion was that <coughs> excuse me the cost of this work is covered by our insurance with the exception of our deductible correct do we have an option to get that deductible covered under the FEMA relief? We're, we've submitted it, so yeah. that's our intention to get that covered. And, and not wanting to miss an opportunity, and here I'm looking for nods or, or thoughts from fellow trustees. I would propose that, that we follow up from discussion that we had at our retreat a little bit and ask, seize the opportunity of this city campus situation to ask the officer in charge and the senior team to think about lessons learned here not 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 the disaster but what we did and as we go back to post should something be different are we just going to replicate what we did before or is there something that we have learned here or benefited by the experience that we could say hmm as we're reimagining post or somewhat reimagining or at least repopulating it what does the senior leadership team here think ought to be done if anything I know that Dr. guy is actually looking at that okay. specifically certain computer labs or whatever as to you know I just don't want to miss the opportunity of just say well let's just move everything back where it was and I assume that was right let's be thoughtful about it Adam do you want to comment on that? absolutely so I think that we are constantly looking at at that as well as other two campuses north and south to see how things are gonna move and where we need to be so absolutely that that's happening um, I think one of the things that uh, we need to, to consider and talk about and we have a plan is the um, uh, the level of accidents that are happening at, uh, at CD mm -hmm. by way of the traffic Very concerning. Um, and yes and so we had three in one week uh, we did reach yeah. out to the county <coughs> sec, the, the the mayor's office they're working with us to help us it's just the it's our look it's where we are right so uh, we are working internally to see what we need to do different uh, going forward because we do want to use our our building 40 uh, 45 oak we do want to continue to use it but we have to think about how do we need to use that so that it's safe for our students and so that's one of the work that we're doing the mayor office has been very helpful and so we are working with the mayor's office to really figure out what is the best way to address the, uh, the traffic downtown because that is a very um, dangerous uh, we had a situation where we had uh, a, um, a vehicle ran right into um, Oak uh, so mm -hmm. we really need to think through that piece um, and so I think reimagining re not only the inside but reimagining the outside as well to better utilize it but safety first this is really a concerning thing with these accidents Absolutely. is it reasonable to ask that at our next board meeting you or your designee present a report about absolutely. this absolutely absolutely and how absolutely. Did, how we're absolutely. migrating back and absolutely. what we're doing about the inside and outside I think that's a concern should there be conversations with DOT or, or some state 
you know, and going above the city? Because I imagine some of those streets are, are state-owned roads. So they're helping us with that. Okay. So the, 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 uh, the mayor's office, um, his, his um, uh, staff is helping us with this, so we are going to meet with them to, to really talk through to see how this uh, could be worked out. And I think there's some opportunity for us, too, because we do have a tunnel that goes from the post to the uh, gym, correct? Um, yes, center. So we are going to really look at that as a way to make that very attractive and, mm -hmm. and do something so that we create uh, sort of a, a path for our students. Mm -hmm. The problem, though, is that oak. And so what mm -hmm. do we need to mm -hmm. do? We did talk to an architecture as well about what do we need to do? Is there a bridge or something? So we are talking but I will uh, be able to provide at our next board meeting and uh, detail the work. But the, the, certainly the city is mm -hmm. helping us to even further discuss um, how we could improve. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm glad of that. I think that's important and we want to elevate that. Absolutely. So. And Paul, maybe if you could touch on a little bit about South, just to give an update, highlight update. Oh, yeah. As far as, as it, it, we're working <laughs> with tur with Turner, right? Oh, and yeah. Yeah. Just that was the board approved that a few months ago. They're actually planning on starting to come into the space uh, next week. Um, the bills, they're planning on breaking ground, I believe. It, it seems like it keeps moving back a little bit, uh, but they're, they're planning on definitely being uh, excavating by, some, by May or early May. Um, they still haven't, I, I noticed there's a, a few excavators on site, but they haven't started putting up the construction fence. The bills actually, though, they have had staff where they uh, put up a fence down the middle of the, I don't know what lot it is, if it's their lot five, which is the one, you know, right between the campus and the stadium. They took down the RV lot or fence, which ran right down the middle of that parking lot. Uh, their flag is up where their 50 yard line is going to be, but they really haven't broken ground. I'm so sure there'll be a big ribbon cutting or something when they do break yeah, down. We, we have meetings with them every Tuesday morning just to kind of keep updated as to you know how they're going to progress. Uh, they're working with DPW as far as the timeline for moving our domestic and sewer lines from running through the construction site to coming off of Southwestern to the college. Uh, there's a fiber optic line through there also that will be addressed at the same time. Well, Paul, and, and I'm from the board's perspective, you know, we're trusting you to be the eyes and ears of the college with respect to that bill's activity. We're glad about the revenue stream that's coming in. That's very good. We've been trying to be good partners to the bills and the county and the state here, but we have a college to run and we've got students in place and faculty, and I, I think it's important that if one of you hears something that, you know, in light of faculty input is a problem, we should know about that and take it up right away. So we do have, um, starting next week, we will pull fa a faculty together to really work with, with the organization to talk about curriculum uh, opportunity for internships. So we did talk about ah, that as Tuesday. So yeah. we will put faculty have been in constant communicating with myself. I know Colleen will probably mention it about working with that so that we could coexist both from the academic uh, and program offering, but also really the experience of our students. So um, that is happening, that will happen officially starting next week as we put I think we all like together. how it's going so far. You know, we've taken various steps. We, we and the county executive, at, at each of our meetings, I ask him and his uh, legislative, you know, his chief of staff, Ben, you know, how are we doing out there? Do we have any issues, any, you know, flashpoints, problems? And we're getting pretty consistent feedback that no, the partnership's going well among the state, the bills, the county, and, and even your SUNY Erie as a very nearby and important neighbor. Uh, and we've been cooperative with them, but it's something that's unusual. It's way outside of our normal bandwidth, you know, here at the college. So and it's going to be the next two or three, four or five years. So very yeah, important to stay in the mix. We asked them for their construction schedule the other day just to try to get a feel for. Because I know originally yeah. they were talking about going uh, like six twelves, but that was under the premise. I thought they were thinking they were already going to be under construction, so it, it could actually be seven twelves for the earlier part of the construction. We'll work with Dr. Sagai and to the, right. with the frequent meeting with the county executive, who's front and center with the bills and every and the state. We should be able to rectify any problem that you deem is cropping up. Thank you. Uh, I'm done.
my turn? Yes. <laughs> kind of, okay. So, I, so we are, um, thank you. We are getting a visit from our soon, uh, from our uh, new chancellor um, on April 5th. Um, I know it's our spring break, um, and just to, to note, uh, our spring break aligns with the K-12, and that was a decision made, so um, other colleges have, you know, uh, uh, classes uh, next week, so they are coming. Uh, we are very excited. We've been reaching out to faculty, and there's more opportunity to get uh, faculty and students and other staff to be here, so we're really looking forward to having the chancellor and his team uh, be here. I know you got an invitation as well uh, for the board to participate during the first part of the meeting, so we look forward to uh, having the chancellor here. Um, the other uh, event that we just had very successfully, we had our college day, uh, March 24th. That was an opportunity for all of us uh, to come together, work together at the beginning, all of us, and then go um, and, and do it by division. Our focus was really um, assessment impacting student success through teaching and learning. Uh, and I think we, we took a lot from that. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity. It's one of the things I think that we need to even expand more uh, to be able to take that opportunity to work collaboratively with each of, with each of us, uh, each of us to make sure that uh, we're focusing and moving in the, in the <coughs> same direction. Um, just a couple of things that I think um, I want to just, and then I'll bring Dan to talk about graduation. Uh, Ch Chancellor Award for our students of excellence, that's also happening at, at SUNY on April 24th. We have four <coughs> students that were, uh, that are going to get, we had nine, four will be definitely nominated uh, for that award, so myself and others from the college will be attending that event. Um, that will be very exciting and we'll take a lot of pictures uh, to bring to, to the college. Um, with that, I want to get Dan from time to talk about graduation and the most exciting time of our college. Good morning. Good morning. 55 days until commencement. This year's emphasis is going to be placed more on the student experience and more on the engagement of the faculty to highlight what they're doing. What you're seeing in front of you right now is a portion of some things we've stolen from the University of Albany. This year's effort is going to be placed more on what's going on in the back. And we've asked our faculty to come down and be part of that student experience. Line up with our students. Take pictures in front of the boards. Have them write their message. Bob, next slide. Giving them the opportunity to take photos with their friends, photos with their faculty members, right there as they're lined up in their graduation garb. Next one. This will be another key piece. Working with Mike Brome, we're identifying and going to be highlighting first generation students. Coming out of the back also this year, Bob is working to help us get uh, support from Buff State to do live feeds. We'll be able to do pictures of the <coughs> boards, pictures of our students lining up. Being able to feed that right up to the front video so families know, hey, what, oh, music started? No, wait a second. We've got more build up in the back. Yeah, this is, uh, it's going to be some fun if we can make this all work. As families come in this year and they come up the ramp into Buff State, they're going to be met by displays of our student work, pictures of actions in the classroom, things like Nate's students were down here today. They'll walk in and see our work. They'll be able to come in and sit down in front of the video as they're waiting for commencement, and they'll see highlights from some of the classes, the highlights of our national champion cross-country athlete, the video from last year's performance arts programs. So they'll have things going on on the video board, engaging them, showing them, highlighting what our students are doing. One of the pieces we'll be doing more this year too to help emphasize the academics and emphasize the programs is each one of our, our Honor Society curriculum as well as our PTK and all of our opportunity and Honor Society programs will be highlighted with slides showing what their accomplishments are. The DAPI, which is very special to me, this is our Delta Alpha Pi, which engages our students and honors who are with different abilities. We'll have that highlighted up on the board, showing people that our population of students, which is about 800 plus, which is about 10 to 11 percent of our overall population, who have different abilities, who are making success in the classroom. Dan, one thing um, when, you that, when you mentioned that, sure. uh, if you look at some of the budget materials, there's a special <coughs> piece of money that the state is directing toward students with disabilities or other abilities, and 
Uh, that seems to be a focus of at least of one of the House bills. I'm not sure where it falls between the governor and the two houses, but that's out there. We're very aware of that. We've been working on that Perkins program for years. Uh, what you'll find within our, our student access areas, we do have one of the higher retention rates, one of the higher engagement rates across right. the college itself. Um, we do a great deal of one-on-one -on -one case management. Our population across the three campuses <clears throat> here at North actually being the highest relates right with our student population. The neurodiversity of our students, engaging them and finding a way to help them recreate their experience in the classroom, that's what our case managers are doing on a regular basis. It's, so. Dan's, it's Dan's work and his team's work that informed the Perkins grant that you just approved, approved that yeah. universal design for that's learning. Fantastic. Yeah, we, we partnered with uh, with money coming. And we partnered with OTA a couple years ago to create an academic success program, where we've actually have some of their students, along with other students who are training, mentoring our students from the student access area. Mm -hmm. So we are out there every single day. I'm former military. Um, we have dirty boots every single day. <laughs> those counselors, those students, those those members who are working with us. You'll see this year coming out of the back. Um, faculty leading out the students. Normally you'll have the processional of the faculty comes out, great, they get seated, then the students come out. This year we're actually gonna have faculty members one-on-one -on -one carrying out the banners, leading them out by division. So when it comes time for them to walk across the stage, now we recognize students from our allied health programs, including blah, 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 blah. And those faculty members from those programs are gonna be brought in to create a receiving line. Yeah, it's like a little mini reception from a wedding, but get up, get out of your chairs, get over here and shake hands with your students. Colleen has offered to uh, to make sure that happens. She's got a uh, nice cattle <coughs> to move people along with, so. Um, I do. Beyond that, it is it should be very interactive this year. It should be approximately the same amount of time as last year. We are starting an hour earlier to give everyone a chance to get their evenings back. But we should be looking at about, I think we had 750, it was the approximate number that have applied yet to be fully certified. Bob, what did we walk last year? Last year we had 860 certified, we had 440 show up. So we're rolling, we're 55 days out. Uh, should be a good time. Is there a guest speaker concept this year? Or a guest speaker, yeah. I'm sorry, I skipped on that one. The Arthur Duncan, uh, who is a alumni of our program, uh, right. alumni of our school, will be giving our guest speaker address. We do have a student speaker, which uh, we're working through that right now. We've also considered the point of having. Um, Stealing an idea from SUNY Geneseo, a senior oration, giving students an opportunity to apply for a three to five minute opportunity to come up, say what this meant to them to be here. Uh, that'll be rolling out shortly. I like that. Thank you so much. Well, again, thanks, it goes it goes back to our, our morning theme and continue to that, that student first, but with academic success and academic excellence. And I like the faculty piece too. Oh, I remember last year, Colleen, they stood up for the first time and were recognized. It was post COVID. It had been a couple years skipped or something. And I think someone said, well, that's the first time the faculty's been invited to stand up and be recognized. Right. I said, what is that? Right. So that piece should never go away. And this is actually better than that. Mm -hmm. So just um, hold these ideas. Don't let them slip away after this year. Oh, it won't. <laughs> it's, it's I trust your military background. <laughs> <laughs> This is a piece where we've had some amazing people step up. That's right. Bob was out portion of this last year. He's back with us again this year. Colleen's taking on another 10 different tasks that she's willing to work with. Um, we're going to keep pushing this forward. This is not just a one and done situation. I like the theme. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know that's been important to you. Eric? Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Well, I'm going to share the slide here. I love following Dan and Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad. You know, it's great. The energy is, is so to capture that, um, what I'm showing you today is our enrollment. Uh, at this point in time, thanks to Kathy and her diligent work, we do have our what's called end of term numbers. These are really the numbers that I look forward to because this indicates then where we are at the end of that academic period. So here's fall 2022. And there's a lot of numbers on here, but I think following Dan's momentum and the conversation here today of you know, student success and, and focus, uh, I want to look at our undergraduate first time uh, category. So that's the second row that you see here. If you go all the way to the right and you look at the percent FT compared to prior year, I know 0.9% increase doesn't sound like a huge accomplishment, but given the challenges and the changes that we have made 
since the fall of 2021 semester, uh, the reorganization of the institution, the work that you saw and then you highlighted about us as one team, one college, Mike's work with marketing, all these different things. You saw on top of that a declining high school um, graduation rate within Western New York and to end up here at the end of the fall semester with a 1% increase in how many of our full-time equivalents that are taking classes here, uh, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. And I think that's really a testament of us all, faculty, staff, leadership working together in one direction that can really, I think, highlight and capture the, the impact of SUNY Erie within the community. Um, there are certainly other areas of growth, and we're seeing this nationwide. This is our concurrent high school enrollment, what we call here our advanced studies. Um, that overall, both in terms of headcount and FTEs, uh, is growing. Cheryl Duquette, I'm indebted to, she does a remarkable job of helping to lead our advanced studies team uh, and, and our partnerships with the high schools. That doesn't go without saying that there are challenges, and these are challenges that are seen not just here, but as you mentioned, um, Arda, about the, across the SUNY institutions in general. Um, our continuing students, returning students, so that's down 4%. That is where, as, as Dr. Sagai and others here have highlighted at the College Senate and others, is what can we do then to help keep the students we have? And I know Colleen will probably be presenting on some of these different initiatives here. There's a lot here that our faculty and staff are doing to see you know, what can we do to help get our students registered again, uh, to keep them engaged. And there's some really great activities that Colleen, Chris, and other faculty are spearheading that I think are really exciting to see, as well as Colleen Reedy um, this, this semester. So if you go down just a little bit, just to show it visually, um, this is then where you see our current enrollment across these different categories. The one category that's new, and this is restricted to our end of term, is what's called here unknown. Please don't think of this as these hidden uh, student population. This is reflective of our non-tuition activity, so what we commonly refer to as our Pathways program. So these are students that are taking non-tuition, non-credit activity here. Um, and what was really proud about that as well is with, again, the way that we are reorganizing the institution, you had less than a percent decrease in terms of headcount. So that's, again, a reflection of what Justin Kiernan and the Pathways area is doing. And the hope, not the hope, but the plan of how it is that they're fully integrated into the college and how it is that we talk about matriculating those students into then our degree granting programs. That's a really remarkable opportunity. This is talking about the underserved, underrepresented refugee resettlement population, English as additional language opportunity that we provide to our community. And there's some really great success stories that come from that program here. But I don't think it takes any statistician when you see where that greatest opportunity lies is the one there in green uh, with how it is that we then attract our continuing uh, and returning student population. So these are our final numbers at the end of the fall semester. And so overall as an institution, again, given all the changes, we ended up with as overall as an institution, 2.6% decrease from the year prior in our FTEs, which again, considering all the changes that are happening in higher ed, the changes we made internally, the changes in our ever-changing high school graduation landscape, uh, I think that's actually really quite a tremendous success. Again, I'm not saying that we sit on our laurels here, that by any means there's still a lot of opportunity, but all things considered, I think that's a reflection of the opportunity that we have in front of us. Look forward now into spring. I think spring really captures a similar sentiment about the importance of that retention, the, the persistence. So here, we are looking at what's called our early student survey. Think of this as an initial point of census data um, by after the ad drop period here. What we then did is compare that to what's our, our point in time comparison. So we are seeing some pretty sig um, significant in areas of decline in our continuing student um, population. This is typically for the spring. You see the green if we go down just a little bit. I think visually you can show it. Spring is a, uh, a situation where we don't get a ton of new students um, during this particular time, but is a reflection of the students that we currently have here and their ability to continue and to, to persist. Uh, I think this is a really remarkable opportunity as we get that that's the student engagement, the work with this. There's, a tremendous opportunity. There's a lot of great initiatives that are taking place to help with that. Um, one of the areas of significant growth is that concurrent high school population. The numbers here honestly may be a little bit inflated because of this actually may reflect a bit more of our increasing in the efficiency of how we report our numbers. 
not necessarily an increase in our overall activity for concurrent high school, we'll see that at the end of the semester. So when you see a 56 and 60% increase, although that's tremendous, we are gonna end up, a projected one is increased uh, with our concurrent high school activity this spring compared to last spring, may not just be at that magnitude because of when we presented the numbers this year compared to the prior year, um, we got a lot more of our students registered at this point in time than we'd had in prior years. And that's an increase in our internal processing. And then summer, summer is um, ongoing. We, um, some of the highlights for there, uh, thanks to the registrar's office and the work that they did, uh, we were able to release the schedule significantly sooner than we did the year prior. Um, and so we are still seeing uh, some pretty continuous enrollment activity. I suspect, similar to what we saw last year, is that as our fall schedule is released, which is scheduled to be released next week on Monday, we also tend to see a boost in our summer uh, online activity at that point, or registration activity at that time. We do have messaging going out to our current students, um, as well as also promoting it on social media and website, and we're constantly working with Mike and his team to get the message out that we're here, uh, and that we're ready to, to help students uh, on their academic journey. Congratulations on the, the increase. I mean, that's, that's helpful to see any bright news, you know. And uh, go ahead. Uh, Eric, do you have numbers on the students from Erie County that are going to NCCC and the other places? I do. So we can go into the, that granular level, absolutely. And there is an opportunity through SUNY and the BI to try and bring them back. Correct. One of the things I, I do like to highlight is that when we do look at our institution relative to those in our areas, we are seeing so some significant improvements um, in our enrollment compared to other institutions. So that first time um, status that, that we looked at, we were one of the only institutions in our region actually see an increase in that category this year in the fall semester. Uh, I think that's a, an accomplishment. But I do continuously look at then our, our peers, both at the two-year and the four-year institutions, to look to see where there are those opportunities for, for improvement. Those are a double win. We add tuition here and, and the charge county back. doesn't have to pay yeah. some other county. Correct. And here, I'll, I'll just quickly add to that something I should have mentioned. Now that we have the ability to advertise digitally, that allows us for the first time to begin really marketing outside of Erie County strategically, cost effectively. We have a number of programs that are available 100% online, which means anyone in the state can take them. Mm -hmm. And that means we now have an opportunity to get some of those chargebacks ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very well, thank you. <laughs> So as you could just see, right, I think that the, the enrollment is a big deal, but I think that engagement and retention is even more critical for us. And I think part of what you heard from Dan talking about graduation, but what are we doing for those students that are here right now? And I think one of the things that we have done is have uh, Colleen Reedy oversee, uh, in addition to workforce, uh, to help the college at this point oversee student affairs so that we are very, um, um, deliberate about the different activities that we're doing. So uh, with uh, the marketing support under Mike and with Conley Reedy helping that side of the house, now we're seeing a lot of engagement with students. As we all know, the best retention for students is other students, right? We could come up with great ideas, but if they're enjoying and have, we have created uh, an environment where they're having activities and they're both in and outside the classroom, the level of engagement that we're having this semester is really different compared to what we have done. So we're gonna to continue to work on that. Um, but part of it is this you know, collaboration that we have to do. And I believe that part of what we have to do is the internal efforts, everything that we're doing, but then what do we need to do in terms of partnerships? So K to 12, as Eric mentioned, the advanced, um, study. Um, um, I, I've been meeting with um, the superintendent, specifically the Buffalo superintendent. We had a great discussion about the opportunity to expand, not only from advanced studies, but really making sure that those students know that SUNY Erie is here. What can we do? So that was a very healthy discussion to follow up more on that. Um, uh, other individuals within the community, um, uh, Urban Lake, the chief, uh, uh, the CEO of Urban Lake, we had a, a really nice discussion um, on the idea that what if 
if possible, if SUNY Erie could also offer courses at the site. We know that has been a successful formula for us to go actually be at that. So the idea that we're present, we are pre present at the in Western New York is going to be probably one of the most key way for us to continue to engage and enroll students um, in the community. So that's been uh, very uh, 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 fruitful. Um, and then the other thing is really at the state and federal level, right? I I attended the um, Albany, uh, the Chancellor's President's meeting, as well as meeting with state legislator. And I think uh, it was probably one of the best experiences uh, to go in and really advocate not only from a budget, but also talk about our college and the difference that it makes in the community and to hear the positive response from those individuals who know our community really well and making sure that their district is being represented, but also through Kathy's effort, uh, getting data from uh, from our uh, college indicating how many students within, uh, within that district is served by our college and to really present that and to really say to them, this is the evidence that we do serve our students and we do serve those individuals that you oversee uh, on your district. So that was a very uh, um, uh, productive uh, meeting with them as well. And as uh, Chair Stone uh, mentioned earlier, that we're constantly meeting with the um, with the county exec every month, and I think we're having a meeting um, next week perhaps, uh, to talk and discuss about everything that we talked about. So that's an ongoing um, uh, co collaborating, collaboration that we're doing. Uh, one of the things I want to mention, that partnership uh, is key, um, and so that is our industry partner, right? So we have to make sure that we continue that uh, um, industry partner. We do have our 2023 Advisory uh, Council and Superintendent uh, Breakfast that we're going to be hosting here on April 19th at 8 o'clock. Uh, we do have a guest speaker as well as our, our student speakers that will be talking to our partners. So the idea is really to collaborate K-12, industry partner, nonprofit, right, and how to, and obviously our government, government stakeholders to make sure that we really are moving in the right direction. So I'm constantly involved with that, making sure that SUNY Erie is at top of mind of everyone. Uh, and I think to constantly hear, especially as it relates to alumni, and to know that a lot of uh, individuals in the community graduated from here or had some experience with the college is really um, encouraging and uplifting to, to, to constantly meet people uh, in the community. So Speaking of that, Real quickly, uh, there is an opportunity to nominate Erie Community College graduates for a Distinguished Alumni Type Award. I think the deadline is April 12th. It's through the foundation. Yes. yes. So just be aware. I'm actually thinking of a couple of people that I know who are fantastic graduates of the college who I'm thinking of nominating. So um, Kelly, if you could circulate, please, the form to all the trustees uh, that came from the foundation, so that. <coughs> We can think about it, and if you want to go more broadly to anyone else in the room who doesn't have it, fine. I think we should cast a net widely because I've talked about this in the past, the idea that we should be trumpeting those unbelievably successful people who have come from SUNY Erie in our community, leaders of every segment of our economy. Um, so this is part of that. Uh, lastly, we will be hosting the uh, Western New York Community College uh, Consortium on May 24th, uh, again to highlight our college and the, the, um, uh, the campuses and what we do, so we are hosting uh, that event here as well. I would encourage everyone to come see Chancellor King. This is a person who is of amazing stature, Secretary of Education under President Barack Obama, now Chancellor of the SUNY system visiting all 64 colleges, and, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a rare opportunity, yeah. and um, I fully intend to partake of it, and hope that some other trustees come at 1230, and, and maybe even throughout the day a little bit. Uh, there will be a Northland visit in the mix. That's really important. I know I do know that it's a vacation time, and people are away, and faculty's off and stuff, so you've got to be respectful and knowledgeable of that, but this is a great opportunity, so if you have a chance and you're flipping a coin, try to make it. Okay. Good. Is that thank it? you. Yes. Yes. Thank right. you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, um, Amanda. I, I, you are not officially a committee yet, and the reason <laughs> for that is the bylaw situation. Right. So we're doing it. But I would like to give you an opportunity to speak about your thoughts on the, the new committee and what you might <coughs> want to do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited, and thank you, Chairman, for um, creating this new committee. Uh, we have decided to name it Talent, Diversity, Equity, and Belonging. 
and we'll find a cute little shorter name to use. <laughs> um, but it really, want, we wanted to highlight what our focuses were when, when you creating that committee. There's nothing wrong with the mm -hmm. HR committee. Yeah. Then I get that's totally mm -hmm. fine, but um, we're gonna be meeting in two weeks. It's gonna be our first meeting, working on looking at priorities. Um, yes, obviously, the, you know, grievances and personnel issues will come up, but I this is more of a high level. This is not management. We're not changing decisions, but we're looking into, hey, what are these policies considerations? How do we apply things more equitably across the board? What can we be doing better to work with our union partners in, in moving things forward and coming out with uh, collective and positive outcomes for everybody. Thank you, and Candace, thank you for your engagement over there as well. Any thoughts from your side of the table? Just a question, diversity, that's coming up in two, two committees now, which is excellent yes. and appropriate. Um, what is your, your um, envisioning of, of how that will impact this particular committee? So, um, one for hiring purposes, like what considerations can we take, you know, can mm -hmm. look at. Um, one would be our chief diversity officer position that is currently vacant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at those types of things and, okay. and, and being more inclusive for all types. Okay, perfect. perfect. Yeah, that's a good question because diversity, I, I don't think it's wrong necessarily that no. remain in each portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to be that mm -hmm. fussy about mm -hmm. it because we all should be thinking along Absolutely. those lines, right? No matter what our committee. but. If, if you if you ever grow uncomfortable between the two of you, is, is that too fuzzy? Are we losing it because we're not making it clearly enough in one portfolio? Let us know. We'll make another change. You know, as a group. I think it's entirely appropriate for it to be in both both portfolios oh, on both right. committees. Okay. I think the committees are different enough, um, and the focus is is appropriate in these two places. So. And Kelly, next month I think we'll be able to hear from Amanda's committee as part of our regular order. Okay. Good. Uh, Marcel, we student trustee report, please. Yeah, I have some notes today. <laughs> so just excuse me if I have to read it. But, uh, so talking back about the, the, the lounge, the, the student lounge it brought like real vibrancy to the campus and students like love it. It's a new, new old place for students to hang out, you know, after the renewal, the students are always there. And uh, SGA is looking at additional spaces in all three campuses to create more of these areas for students so they can like hang out together, you know, just like have like a, a, a better student college life. Uh, students all also appreciate having the input into the redesign of the K building. Uh, they are trying to create a new student lounge or like a student area in K Beauty and we have students like helping to redesign it. They really appreciate that. Uh, the feedback from city campus, although we had the, <coughs> the, the building shutting off for the, because of the, the pipe, the bars and everything, uh, uh, we got reports that they feel like a closer community because they have less space, people are like more around each other, you know, so they're forced to sit next to each other, so they're like talking more, and they really like what is going on there. At Oak, you know? Marcel? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at Oak and Flickinger Center. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we thought yeah. we might, might oh, hear and that. Yeah, although we, yeah. we had to move in, you know, like last minute, uh, accommodations for them. They, they really like what is going on there, you know, like. Well, going back to the request I made to you uh, half an hour ago about a report, that's something, how can we preserve that as we move back to the traditional space? Mm -hmm. it, it, like, in my opinion, this is like a really interesting because one thing that was really different for me when I came here to U.S. and I started my life in college is like, uh, you see that uh, students they have like a it's not an issue but it, it's hard for them to like you know start a conversation with another one because they think they might be invading personal space and like putting them closer together is just making it happen so it's yeah it's really interesting uh, also SGA and other students are working with VP Reedy and Dean Perry to have food available outside the traditional times that ASC operates. 
Uh, so the afternoon students have access to food, which was one of the complaints, you know, that the ASC cafeteria was closing like too soon. So we are working on that. Uh, also, this is the only negative uh, point in my report. So students have brought up concerns about the availability of uh, important uh, student services offices, such as financial aid, bursar, and registrar. The people working in the office are great and very helpful, but there are not enough people working in those areas to accommodate students' needs. Students have uh, expressed that not having as much access to these services is one of the reasons that they are considering not returning to SUNY Erie. You know, they, uh, they really appreciate all the staff and faculty, like things, they, they need help, they are being helped. But sometimes when they search for the, the services, you know, uh, we have like a, just like a short window of time that they are available or they, they get there and they are available, but they're like a line in front of them and they don't have time to be waiting because they have classes or other stuff to do. So, and that's everything. So well noted on that one, um, Marcellus, thank you. Uh, the college is moving and hiring in those areas. That is okay. really an area that, um, pe and people move from that area, from the financial aid office to the business. So there is a vacancy in that and so the college is committed. Uh, to, to oppose for those positions and hire both in the financial aid and the registrar's office to make sure that we're serving students and have the appropriate coverage so we're moving forward. Uh, it does take a little bit of time because of the process of recalling people who were laid off so we do have to follow that process so that has been an issue of timing but we do have to do a due process to make sure that those people who were laid off um, are you know part of the recall as appropriate so we are taking that uh, part of that process as well so but we will be filling those positions it's important yes yeah. absolutely yeah like I think uh, being also a student uh, we had like a great changes in in the college yes. but uh, I, I feel like we are going the right path you know we, we we had great changes and we are having like a trouble with the staff you know we're understaffed but uh, we, we're trying to fix that and because I'm also a student, I, I really didn't see like a, a huge difference in how the college is like being served by the staff. The staff is doing an amazing job. It's just like some areas, you know, you need more help, more people, and they're not having this. But besides this, the college is doing great. I feel like we're in the right direction. Well, you're always very thoughtful and you have a good list with you about <laughs> things, small and large. Very important. Thank it's the role of the student trustee in particular is that uh, you're right, right out there. So we listen and hopefully by next month, I remember any number of issues that were resolved mm -hmm. quickly once mm -hmm. you or a prior student trustee brought them up. Mm -hmm. So let's try to stay with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Colleen, I've mentioned you a few times today, but now <laughs> finally you get to come up and <laughs> share your thoughts officially. Okay. Well, good morning. Um, I actually have quite a few things that are going to piggyback off of several things that have been discussed to give you a little bit more detail about uh, what College Senate and what our faculty and staff are doing to help support the different uh, areas of the college and where we're moving and moving forward. Um, so with College Day, which was um, last week, we uh, had a faculty panel. We talked about different opportunities that could be similar to what our uh, EAL and Autotech collaboration had. Um, so with that, uh, we have had several potential collaborations that have since happened, uh, for example, at South Campus, our business department and our architecture um, technology department are talking about ways that they can collaborate and use the uh, fabrication lab. Uh, so there was some great discussions that's been going on with that. Uh, as uh, it was mentioned under Paul's report and Adiam had mentioned the academic integration opportunities that we're looking at with the Buffalo Bills and the NFL. So uh, potential uh, internships, apprenticeships, uh, work study, things that we can do with our <coughs> students. Um, obviously it's a large construction project so we have things like construction management and our engineering and all of that but also we'd like to bring in our our business uh, department as well. We have uh, organizational behavior, sports management, marketing, principles of management, uh, business communications, all right there at our South Campus, uh, which is very convenient, of course, that it's 
right next to where the stadium is being built. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, having faculty input and faculty a part of those uh, conversations, and um, which is great that starting next week. So I have, I didn't mention this earlier, I've been kind of pushing like, so what, you know, how many faculty are, are uh, a part of this discussion? Because, uh, you know, I'm available. And if yeah. I'm not, I have a, a slew of people that I can tap that can be available to be part of these very important conversations to make sure that we are utilizing all the programs that we are offering our students so that our students in those programs can have these opportunities because it's not every day that a college has a giant NFL stadium built uh, right next door it's and huge. virtually on its property. <laughs> and so. Just a quick thought on that is it, it, we don't have to ask the Bills and the NFL and others, Turner, to hire our students, right, and make them full-time employees. Even an internship or a two-week thing mm -hmm. creates a resume item, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That they had some exposure there. I hope it's more. I hope there's a huge engagement. But don't turn your nose up mm -hmm. at even small opportunities for, I know you wouldn't, mm -hmm. but get that resume item, uh, some exposure, it could lead to a new job. Absolutely, absolutely. And our uh, business department in particular has some contacts with Pagula Enterprises and has routinely brought um, classes of students over to the Bill Stadium for different opportunities to experience within the stadium. Um, so I know uh, those partnerships are also being tapped for that as well. Uh, with the Buffalo Bill Stadium, and May, I think we said for excavation, I just want to, uh, that's also final exams. <laughs> so I'm hoping that um, someone has that back here when we are in those discussions that uh, it is finals uh, in those two weeks there, uh, which can be stressful, obviously, for our students. They stress me out, and I'm not taking the test. I'm making the test, <laughs> right? So um, I can, uh, so that we keep our students in mind for uh, that, that area of time as well. Um, with the Chancellor's visit next week, uh, very exciting. Uh, we've, I've tapped, I'll be out of town with my kids, but I've tapped uh, the vice chair and then our accreditation chair, who's also our faculty council representative, Jackie Bossman and Erica Hundra, to be there on the College Senate's behalf. Uh, Jackie is actually right now in Utica for a SUNY conference with uh, the faculty council and the chancellor is going to be speaking in about two hours down there. Mm -hmm. So we're really looking forward to all the different things that she's going to be bringing back. Um, there is going to be uh, clarity on the Jackie's budget. What's last name? Bossman. Oh, yeah, Jack, right. Yep, Jackie Bossman. Oh, well, yeah. uh, but yeah, she'll be bringing back uh, some clarity on the budget question. That's Great. a large topic of conversation for today at the plenary. Um, the Chancellor is speaking today at 1.30. The SUNY Board of Trustee uh, Meryl Tisch is also going to be speaking. And then um, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Community College, Johanna uh, Duncan Partier, will be tomorrow. Uh, we're looking at taking all of that information and then creating a roadshow, is what we're calling it, for SUNY Erie. We did have one seven years ago, um, and the model is on a Friday, it's SUNY, uh, SUNY Erie wide. So we'll have a portion for faculty and staff, but trustees uh, and students as well on that Friday, and then we'll do a uh, faculty only on a Saturday. We did one seven years ago um, before this board in its current makeup. Uh, I believe Denise, uh, former chair, Denise Wilson, was a brand new trustee at the time when we did that. So I feel like that is a good opportunity for us to bring it back this year, especially with everything that's going on, and we have new uh, board members and things like that. Sure. Um, and do you have a date for that yet? Sorry to Not yet. We're shooting for June, okay. um, so <laughs> after the semester, but also um, before K-12 gets out of school mm -hmm. because we know that uh, that'll be our, our largest opportunity to try and uh, have our faculty and staff. Uh, it's also summer session one is going on, so we're mm -hmm. very busy uh, still in, in that time period. Okay. So we're shooting for June. I don't have an exact date yet. Um, mm -hmm. That is one of the things that uh, Jackie Bossman is going to be working okay. with um, the chair of the faculty council, Christy Woods, to get these things in motion for, sure. uh, for all of us. So that'll be, um, that is exciting. Uh, some other things that we have done, um, as I believe Erickson pointed out, uh, we have a faculty driven, uh, we're calling them retention days now. We started it at South Campus in the spring of last year, uh, out of self-preservation uh, with all the changes that were going on at South. Our students wanted to stay at South. 
So our goal was to have them uh, registered before the end of the semester because as uh, Chairman Stone, you pointed out, my mantra has been, you know, the best way to retain our students is to, uh, our, is our enrollment is, is retention, right? So if we have our students registered before they leave us in May, it's a highly uh, likely they'll still be here with us in the fall. So retention is the goal. Our registration dates, our retention re registration dates are gonna be May 17th, or I'm sorry, April 17th and April 20th. So uh, two weeks after the break, and they are all uh, faculty led. Uh, I've been, I met with Colleen Reedy on Monday. I can't believe it was, seems like it was yesterday, Colleen, mm -hmm. uh, on ways that her office can support us. Um, and one of the things to um, Marcel's point is uh, at South Campus, financial aid is only there on Mondays. So uh, one of our retention days is a Monday, but we would like financial aid to also be there on Thursday the 20th. We're gonna be having our event at South and the other campuses as well in areas where we're gonna have computer labs and things like that for our students. So it's gonna be like a one-stop shop. They're gonna come in, we're gonna have music, we're gonna have food, we're gonna have raffles, get your schedule, and did you fill out your financial aid? Come on over here. We're gonna have people over here to help you fill out your financial aid. Do you know that we have scholarships? Let's pull up the scholarship form, all of those things. There's also textbook scholarships, things that our students don't know. And we are doing it in our classrooms. We do have a new, uh, you know, website and it's right there at the front of the website when you log in but our faculty and staff are also promoting them within our classrooms and to get our students to apply I tell them so they should apply for all of them really yes apply for them all write your two essays mm -hmm. apply for everything because money is money right um, so that's one of our goals for these retention days we also uh, as uh, our children are growing as faculty members I have a sophomore in high school we have a lot of uh, parents with kids that are going to be going to college in the fall. So what we're noticing is that other colleges have accepted students' days. And we have never had one before. So Chris Polinski is um, a South Campus uh, English instructor. Um, he has been working with me with the retention days, but we're also going to be doing a um, accepted students' day across the three campuses on May 2nd. And it's going to be similar. Come on in, you know, get a tour, very homey, music, raffles, food, let's get you registered what do you need you need financial aid let's get you registered for um or get it filled out right uh so it's again a one-stop shop make it very um well fun right we need to have that student engagement piece we want them engaged immediately before they even graduate high school so that they're excited to come here and they stay excited and then we'll carry on the excitement once they're ours in the fall um I like Dan brought up our commencement, which is awesome and very exciting. And uh, I have been, uh, <laughs> as I think he said, I have a cattle prod uh, working with faculty. We sent out a reminder this morning for faculty to fill out because there are robes and things that uh, the school does get on our behalf so we don't have to find them in the back of a closet or under a bed or anything like that so that we can uh, be out there with our students and be one with them. Uh, it's very exciting, the work that's been going on for commencement. Because um, as Chairman Stone, you mentioned, uh, having faculty be a large uh, component of the graduation and commencement is, uh, it's a first, it's exciting. Um, you know, to use Dan's analogy, we are the boots on the ground. We are the ones that deal with our students on a day-to-day -day basis. We're not just teaching them math or whatever other topic it is, but we are helping them navigate uh, how to be students and uh, their experience here. So it's very exciting and we're very excited about the opportunity. Next College Senate meeting is April 18th and uh, it'll be streamed and of course anyone here is welcome to attend. And um, I think that's it for me. Do you have any questions? Thanks as always, Thank Colleen. Appreciate All right. you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are close to the end of the meeting on that score. Um, I know the meetings go kind of long, so, and you know, lots of that, you know, that's on the person running the meeting, right? So that's me. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, 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 I'm always balancing because I, I personally, and I think the other trustees draw a lot of energy from the different voices that we hear in these meetings. And you know, there's a school of thought that the, the meeting should just be strictly business, you know, cut and dry, get the motions approved and whatever. It's just not quite my philosophy of that, but we do want to be respectful of not only the time of the trustees, but those around the edge of the room, you know, who are very important here to the mission. So we'll, we'll be mindful of that, certainly, and try to, you know, 
try to bear in mind that it's not everybody's you know ideal use of time to be here but for the trustees just know that those of you who speak with us we are listening we're trying to add that to the mix of information that we're dealing with throughout the college and um, it's very valuable to us so it's always a balancing I'll try to be mindful of time but also input and keep working on it okay uh, any old business I hope not <laughs> <laughs> I think we covered a lot of business, uh, for sure. Um, and as far as new business, the only thing I really would just let I mention again is just the chancellor thing. I think the chancellor has a, it's a background role, but SUNY runs us, in, and we, any opportunity to engage with SUNY leadership at the highest level is to be, is to be grabbed. So uh, let's do what we can to have a great meeting with the chancellor. We have no reason for an executive session today, so um, unless there's other comments, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Make motion. Okay, thank you, Candace. <coughs> okay. All right, thanks, Amanda. Uh, now, we, Kelly, we don't have officially the six to take this vote, so what I'm going to do is just ask people to assent to an adjournment, and I'll declare it as chair that we are at an end of the meeting. Okay. All set? Good. Phone call, and I know we have a meeting, so.